I would like to wish everyone a good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Um, and I want to, uh, I just want to very briefly go over the rules. First of all, the first rule is no personal attacks. Second rule is one fool at a time. The format for the speaker is as follows. The speaker speaks. We have a brief Q&A session. And then we have the infamous rebuttal period. Where are we going? Now I'm going to turn over to Brown to uh, our speaker tonight. And his, his topic is the future of education in Illinois. Uh, no small topic. And uh, he, uh, he speaks. Uh, for education reform uh, for the uh, Illinois Policy Institute. Uh, and he will tell us about himself. Because I didn't know. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm the Director of Education Reform at the Illinois Policy Institute. Uh, we have an office in Chicago and Springfield. Uh, we uh, advocate for um, policies at this, primarily at the state level and a bunch of different issues, education, um, pensions, tax and budget, um, government transparency. So I am the education person at uh, the Illinois Policy Institute. So um, I'm basically in charge of uh, anything that has to do with education policy there. So I spent part of my time down in Springfield talking with legislators, part of my time doing analysis of legislation, part of my time doing research. So, so that's what happens at my job. Um, just a little bit of a background about me. Uh, I came out to Chicago in 2004, uh, followed my now wife out here when she got into University of Chicago Law School. Um, I taught I taught at a private school up in Elgin for a few years. Then I went to graduate school at University of Chicago. I got my degree in public policy from there. Um, worked for a couple of education policy organizations um, in the city. Then went back to school and got a graduate degree in journalism um, from Northwestern. So that's, the, that's what brings me to here. So tonight I'm going to talk about the future of education, but in particular um, why I think uh, why I think school choice is the future of education, and why I push for this policy. And feel free to, you know, follow along and think of good questions to ask me. And I hopefully I'm prepared. Fingers crossed. So, basically, this presenta presentation is going to sort of lay out the arguments about why I think we should adopt a system, an education system based on school choice. And what school choice essentially means is that instead of the state or the locality sending money to tax money to the school per student, like they do right now, this money in, instead would be uh, sent to the parents and that they would spend the money on the kid going to the school of their choice. What this means is that instead of having to attend a public school, they can attend a private school instead with that tax money. Um, so that's essentially what school choice is. There's a bunch of different programs, and I'll get to I'll get to that at the end. Here, I'll get to that at the end. Um, but essentially, that's the idea. So I wanted to do a little bit of a thought experiment. Imagine instead of Having, uh, thank you so much. Um, imagine instead of having uh, grocery stores scattered about, we had government funded grocery stores. Okay? So in each locality, in each town, each city, you would have uh, people pay taxes, they would be able to get a certain basket of goods every week or every month you can, you can decide how you want to how you want to do it and um, that's the way it works so let's say it's based off of local property taxes which it is right now okay so in Illinois a lot of the funding for education comes from localities local property taxes not a lot comes from the state okay it's actually one of the um, one of the lowest funding from the state in the country um, 
But let's imagine they ran grocery stores like this. Um, you could you could make an argument similar to education that having people eat healthy generates a lot of positive goods, right? You think about the health insurance savings if somebody if you could decide what somebody was going to eat. But the thing that would happen, like you see in education right now, is that you'd have some communities with low quality grocery stores. Maybe they don't have organic food, these sort of things, um, because it's based on local property taxes. In some places, some parts of Chicago, there's a, uh, a city called East, East St. Louis, down by, down by St. Louis, right on the border, that uh, is extremely poor. They can barely generate $500 a student in local property taxes. But you can imagine, look, so, we have a Whole Foods in Evanston where I live, right? So, but you can imagine, the distribution of grocery stores would be something like this. You'd have some places that could only afford to save a lot, some that would have Whole Foods, some that would even not even have a grocery store, you just get everything delivered, right? You could, let's imagine the North Shore, somewhere in the North Shore, Kenilworth or something like that. Uh, let's say I wanted to have different food. Let's say I was allergic to something and they didn't sell it at my grocery store. Or I wanted to have access to organic food or I'm gluten-free or something like that. Imagine if I had to move to go shop at a different grocery store. Now, you're probably thinking in your head that's kind of absurd. Why would that ever happen? And what I'm arguing here is that it, that's essentially the way our education system is funded. That we put a huge burden on the people who, are, who have the least amount of money to move, to move to a new town, to get access to a better education. And I would say that that's, that's uh, unjust and immoral. So, I, so the system that you know, I advocate for and we envision is one where, like I said, the money gets distributed to the families and they can spend it on education. Um, they can spend it at a private school if they want. And that way, they don't have to rearrange their lives in order to attend a different school. If they're living in Chicago, they can use that money to go to a school next to them, a private school, a Catholic school. They can use one to attend a school in a different district. It sort of opens up a market for schooling. So I would actually argue that um, the way we fund education is actually an exception to the rule. Okay? Everybody thinks it's, it's not, um, but I would argue that it is. So here's three examples of that. So instead of having, having government run grocery stores for people who have a hard time affording their own food, we give people a supplemental nutrition assistance program. So food stamps, essentially. But we don't say you can only use those food stamps at these government-run grocery stores. You can use them wherever you want. If I want to use them at Whole Foods, I can use them. If I want to use them at Dominic's, I can use them. If I want to use them at Save-A-Lot, I can use them. So that's sort of similar to the idea of the voucher. Okay? We're saying you can use this public money and spend it at private places. All Kids is another example. That's, All Kids is essentially a, a Medicaid program for children in the state of Illinois. What do they do? They, have, they give people insurance, Medicaid, and they can go spend it at whatever hospital they want. Right? They can go to whatever hospital. You don't have to go to a government-run hospital when you're on Medicaid. So once again, this is an example of public money being spent at private places. Okay? So this last one, and the reason I'll tell you the reason I referenced to Paul. Um, Illinois actually has a, a grant program for college students. And what this does is it provides about five thousand dollars a year in, in student loan or not student loans, student grants. Grants don't have to be paid back to college students in the state of Illinois, as long as they attend the university here. Now the interesting thing is that that university doesn't have to be a public university. Okay? So I can get money from the state of Illinois and, um, and use that at my alma mater, University of Chicago, Northwestern. I can even use it at a place like DePaul. I can even use it at a, re a religious school, one that's affiliated with a religion in Illinois. So, 
the, the reason I'm saying this is that I don't think what I'm proposing is all that radical. We do it in a lot of other different policies that we already have. So basically what I'm saying is why don't we extend it to K through 12 education? And right, you know, you don't see people out there protesting this math grant that these kids use in college. Um, and I, I'm actually sure that if it was taken away, people would be mad. So, we have those two things. We have sort of the uh, injustice of the current education funding system. We have the fact that it's not really an exception to the rule. And I would also argue too that our education funding system in the state is very, very screwed up. Now, I uh, just got done writing, and it's soon going to be released, a, a pretty thorough research report on the state education funding in Illinois, and uh, it really opened my eyes. So here's how it works. There's a, there's a, a budget that takes up basically 60% of education funding in Illinois. The other stuff, uh, spending on it, uh, special education, transportation, those sort of things. This thing is called the general state aid budget, okay? And here's how it works. Basically the state wants to figure out the capacity of a town or a city to fund its own students. So how does it do that? What it does is it sort of means tests. So by means tests I mean if you go in and apply for welfare, they're gonna ask how much income do you make uh, in a month? Um, do you have any assets, those sort of things. So, so the way the state determines whether or not it should provide, provide a lot of funding or not so much funding to a district is looking at its total property value, okay? That's one of the things, right? So you have, like I said before, there's wide disparities. So a place like East St. Louis can barely, uh, they use, uh, the state uses, uses an assumed tax rate um, of it's a different percent based on whether it's a high school or a uh, K through eight school. Those are sort of details you don't really, really need to know. Um, but anyways, they look at the total property value. Okay. And they set this threshold for what they think is the proper amount of spending per student in the state, sort of the minimum baseline. Right now it's hovering right around $6,200. So basically, if a, if a town can't get that much revenue per student, tax revenue per student, the state comes in and says, we'll fill in the gap, okay? So East St. Louis can only raise around 500. State comes in and gives them $5,500 a student, okay? Uh, well Met, totally different. Well Met has, can raise about $23,000 a student, okay? So, um, the state doesn't give them as much money, right? So it sort of works good in theory. It's, it's a progressive system in, in, in as much as the towns with the, the least amount of property value and the least amount of resources get the most amount of money from the state and the towns that have uh, the most resources get the least amount of money. So that's how it works in theory. It's not actually how it works in practice. That get, gets all screwed up and scrambled up. So, I'm not sure how many of you live in Chicago, but it is uh, a property tax capped district. What that means is that there's limits on how much it can raise its, pro its property tax revenue every year. Basically, it's 5% uh, or the rate of inflation. And the rate of inflation has been really low over the past few years, so it's basically been that. Okay. So after these property tax caps uh, came in place, which was in the early 2000s, these districts realized that they couldn't access as, mu as much revenue because it was capped, okay? But instead of sort of reining in their spending, working with their, t with their teachers to figure out how much resources should be, uh, should be spent at the school, the districts instead went to the state and got a new law passed, which would adjust the total property value that the state sees on their books, which it would adjust it downward and actually make districts look poorer than they actually are. Okay, So this is essentially like me going to sign up for food stamps and forgetting to tell them that I have a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, a Cadillac or a yacht off the coast. I'm not claiming some asset that I have, right? So this is called the PTEL, the formal 
The formal law is called the PTEL adjustment. It basically means the property tax cap adjustment. So, interesting thing. There are a lot of wealthy districts that benefit from this, okay? So, you have a place like Oak Park. Um, they, they raise, if you actually looked at their total property value, they could raise a significant amount of money per student over that $6,000 threshold, which basically means that they're gonna get very little amount from the state. But with this law in place, they get a huge benefit, okay? So it makes them look poorer than they actually are, and they get more money from the state. So this is actually the distribution of, of money uh, per student, so the benefit per student in each of these areas. So Chicago gets about $811 per student in this subsidy. Uh, Cook gets 449, Collar counties get 78, and then downstate gets 25 per student. Because a lot of downstate districts don't have property tax caps. Okay? Property tax caps. Um, so this is, this is really interesting. So you have these wealthy communities benefiting from a system that was supposed to support the worst off communities. Here's, here's another example. Um, you guys all know about TIF districts here. Chicago has like half of its <laughs> property in TIF districts. Um, so a little, uh, a little known thing is that um, the property value in TIF districts isn't counted in the state education funding formula, okay? So what this means, in the case of Chicago, for example, there's about $10.2 billion of property in TIF districts, that's subtracted before the state even sees it from their education education funding formula. So what that means is that instead of their actual property value, it's about $10 billion less, this means they get more funding from the state. So what this actually does is it really incentivizes the use of TIF districts because the state is getting upwards of 90 cents on every dollar of a sub, or that Chicago is getting upwards of 90 cents on every dollar as a subsidy for creating a TIF district. So what we're saying here is that we have an education funding system where people outside of Chicago, downstate, communities like East St. Louis that I brought up before, are paying tax money to the state and that's being diverted to Chicago because they're creating TIF districts. It's essentially a subsidy even though Chicago is the one that gets to decide if they want a TIF district or not, right? If I'm downstate, if I live in Springfield, I can't vote for the mayor who's going to be putting a TIF district in Chicago. I can't vote for those aldermen, but yet I have to pay for it with state money for my income taxes. That is not a well-functioning education uh, funding system. So here, here's sort of the worst offenders. A lot of, most of this is Chicago, about 10 billion of that. 77% of the total of this TIF subsidy, you have Will DuPage, a lot of the collar counties are up there. And you'll see the collar counties usually benefit a lot from these, uh, these subsidies. So here's the last thing when it comes to education funding uh, formula. The poverty grant program. Now, sort of the idea behind the poverty grant program uh, makes, makes sense. Um, essentially says that um, it costs more to educate poorer students, okay? But one of the interesting things that happened is that they changed the way, how they count who's impoverished in the city in the education funding formula back in about 2003, okay? And shortly like thereafter, um, you've seen tremendous growth in the amount of kids who are considered poor. And I would say that, you know, I, I, I would, I would argue that there probably has been growth in the amount of students who are considered poor, but not this much. Um, essentially what the state uses now, before they use the census figures, now they use uh, any student who is enrolled in a DHS program. DHS program meaning Medicaid, food stamps, those sort of things. Um, those thresholds have gone up over time, so instead of being 100% of the poverty level, they're now about 200, 250% of the poverty level. So the state figures that out. So if you look at this first graph, you'll see that this is the amount the 
low income population increased from fiscal year 2000 to fiscal year 2013. So statewide, it's pretty huge. Okay, so you got 44 percent in Chicago. It's now 91. Other Cook was eight. It's now 52. Okay. Uh, Collar counties were five, now 36, you get the idea. So it's grown, gone up a lot across the state. So here's where it gets interesting when it's fund, funded. You don't get a flat grant amount per student across the state if you have a low income student. The more density you have of low income students, the more money you get, okay? So essentially what I mean by that is they look at the average daily attendance, the, the amount of kids who are uh, going to school on an average day, and they uh, divide that by the low income count. Okay, so that's how you get Chicago being way up here. Remember I said they were 91% low income? They get about $2,500 per student. Okay? Uh, Princeton, tiny town in Illinois, they get about $672 per student. Quincy, about 1000 Okay, so as, you, as your concentration goes up, right, see, you get more money. Now one of the weird things, and I was looking into this, and nobody had actually really, really checked out the formula before, but I was doing, I was trying to figure out some stuff for different districts. And what I realized is that there's a little mathematical quirk in this formula. Because it relies on average daily attendance and not, um, not the total amount of students who should be in school, if you, uh, in Chicago, basically, if you are able to get a truant student back to school, you're going to lose that much money per student. So let me say that again. If in Chicago, the way the state education funding formula works, if you are able to convince a kid who has dropped out, who has said, I'm no longer going to school, to come back to school, you are going to lose that much money per student. It is totally backwards and reversed from the way it should be. If anything, if you bring a kid back to school, you should get paid. Right? The district should get paid to bring a kid back to school, not to get disincentivized from bringing a kid back to school. And uh, that was, that was uh, a pretty big eye-opener there. So what I'm essentially saying here is we have all these quirks in the funding system, and given the political realities, given the fact that we have uh, $200 billion in pension debt and we still have a bunch of politicians who can't figure out what the heck to do, yeah. it's not likely that these same politicians are going to crack this formula, that they're going to make this formula work. They're going to suggest minor tweaks here or there, but they, you need something much more radical, something that they can sort of uh, trick people with or get their hands in and manipulate. So, we need school choice now. That's my argument. We can't wait. We need to pass something. Here's some Chicago statistics. Okay. So CPS has never met federal benchmarks for student success. Okay? So there's this thing called adequate yearly progress under No Child Left Behind. It basically tests different, um, uh, the whole student group and then different subsections, different races, um, special education students, those sort of things. CPS has never, never got, or met these federal benchmarks. 7.9% okay? of CPS students are college ready. By college ready, that means that they will earn a minimum of a C in a college class. Okay, it's not an A, not straight A students. It's a minimum of a C. So that's pretty abysmal in my mind. Okay, and this has been pretty persistent over time. Yeah, they'll fluctuate. They'll go up to 8.1 percent. They'll go back down to 7.8 percent. But you don't see a, a jump from 7.9 to 50.4 or something like that. So this is stagnated. And this is the one that really gets me. Right here. So out of 100 entering CPS freshmen, only 6% of those students will end up earning a four-year college degree by the age of 25. Okay? What's even worse, if you look at the Hispanic and African American populations in the city, it's 3%. Half of that. Okay? So let me say it again. 3% of Hispanics and African Americans in Chicago who enter CPS as a freshman will end up earning a four-year college degree by the age of 25. That's pretty good. Can I take this? Okay. So what I'm saying now is, you know, there's a lot of people offering reforms here or there, kind of inconsequential, sort of, sort of minor tweaks. We can't let kids persist in this system. Okay. We need to do something different. So I, 
think school choice works. There's been quite a few academic studies, what we call, uh, I call them gold standard studies, other people know them as random assignment studies, um, that have shown that uh, school choice works. So these are some excerpts from them. Public schools, uh, so this was one looking at school choice programs in Maine and Vermont. And it was looking at the effect that uh, co the competition that a private school has on a public school. How does that make the public school act differently? Okay, so that's one of the key things with this whole school choice thing is this assumption that if you allow the money to flow to private schools as well, public schools are going to be like, oh crap, I can actually lose a kid, right? Their parent might decide this school doesn't work for them. So they might work harder, they might do extra preparation, they might stay after school, those sort of things. So public schools within 10 miles of a town with vouchers, so Maine, Maine, a couple times in Maine had a voucher, experienced a 12% increase in test scores. So this is a measurable effect. In uh, Washington, D.C., there's a, a uh, opportunity scholarship program that allows kids to attend private school. So the kids who attended the private school saw an 82% graduation rate. The kids in the traditional public schools in Washington, D.C. saw 70%. Okay? And this was a study in Milwaukee. Milwaukee actually has the oldest voucher system in the entire country. It started 25-ish years ago. Um, gives uh, scholarships to low and middle income students. In Milwaukee, they saw an eight percentage point uh, uh, jump in reading scores and a seven percentage point jump in math for the kids who earned the, or had the vouchers. So, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about the Chicago school closings, right? Um, in, in my line of work, we hear, we hear about it a lot. I've attended some of the um, some of the hearings. There's been a lot of emotion there. So, every once in a while, I get to sort of engage with people on the other side of this issue as myself. Um, uh, I've met them some sometimes in person. Um, at, at work, we often use Twitter um, to, to talk with people, and. They're complaining about the school closings, but essentially what I say to them is if you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? If you decide to participate in this public system, don't, don't expect that people always to treat you well, right? And you can see that at a lot of the CPS hearings, I think, at least the ones I went to. They were, in my mind, basically PR stunts and marketing, uh, just to make sure that we kind of fake listen to what parents uh, have to say. And we're going to end up doing what we're going to do anyways, because that's what the mayor wants. That's what his board wants. So, one of the ironic things, and I was talking with, with this person on the opposite side of me, is I said, maybe if you had school choice, you could have kept some of those schools open. If the parents want to attend them so bad, they should have the right to do that. You know, you, you've taken the power out of your hands and you've ceded it to somebody else. Okay? You should be able to make that decision as a parent. If you want your kid to attend one of those closed schools, you should be able to do that. Now, right now, you decided to participate in this system, a, partic uh, a system that's controlled by politicians and bureaucrats. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, if you decide to participate in it, you uh, will live with the consequences of it. Okay? So what I would say is this choice thing increases bureaucratic power. It allows the parent to decide what's best for their kid, where their kid wants to go. It doesn't put the power in politicians' hands to do that. So types of school choice. Um, there's traditional vouchers, which you essentially take the state funding and the local funding, bundle that up, give it to the parent. The parent can spend it wherever they want, okay? Whatever school they want. Catholic school, doesn't matter. There's tax credit scholarships. The way these work is um, you give a tax credit to people who donate to scholarship granting organizations, right? And what these scholarship granting organizations do is they hand out scholarships to low and middle income students, and the state usually sets some sort of threshold for that. Okay, so uh, so that's another way. And a lot of states are doing that. Ohio, Florida, Arizona have done that. Uh, vouchers we have in uh, in Milwaukee, Indiana are two prime examples. Uh, parent tax credits. Uh, this essentially allows a parent, if they want to, we have one that's fi worth $500 in Illinois right now. You can get, if you spend over $500 on tuition at a private school for your kid, you can actually get that back uh, off your tax liability. 
But the idea is, is that if, if a parent has the ability to spend, but maybe isn't super rich so they can't just send their kid to any private school, um, they can get some of the money back. And a lot of places now are uh, you know, experimenting with refundable tax credits, right? So it, it doesn't just take away your tax liability, it, you get a credit back from the government on your taxes. The last one is really, really interesting, and it, it only exists in Arizona. Um, it's called an education savings account. And what that is, is it, it's similar to a voucher, but it doesn't have to be spent at a school. Okay, so th they originally had this program for special needs students. So what it did was it gave the, um, it gave the parents the ability to, uh, to hire a private tutor with the money, to buy online courses, all these sorts of things. So that's, that's really where this sort of movement is heading, is really personal, or personal uh, being able to personalize your education, right? That you don't always have to go to school, that you can take online classes, you can have a private tutor, um, all sorts of things. So this is, the, the Chicago Teachers Union always loves to bring up Finland as their example of how a school, should, school system should behave. Okay, I have my own European country, it's Sweden. Okay, Sweden actually has sort of the most pure school voucher system on the planet school choice system. Okay? What they decided about 10, 15 years ago is that they were going to take all the money they spend on education, divide it by the number of students, and then give that money to the parents to spend on schooling. Okay? That is as close to sort of the Milton Friedman-esque idea. Milton Friedman was a University of Chicago economist. He's the guy who came up with uh, school vouchers, school choice. Sort of, the be this is a, the best example of this system Public school, they still have public schools. Okay, they still have private. They have private schools. You can send your kid to a private school. They actually have for-profit schools in Sweden. Okay, a lot of people are like, oh god, for-profit education is horrible. Yeah, it can be if they don't provide good quality. But the great thing about school choice is that you don't have to attend the school. Right? If parents send their kid to a for-profit school and it's not doing well, the the for-profit school will lose money. The parents will leave that school. So there's this sort of reinforcing mechanism there. And here's sort of my last argument for it. Now, this is something that I've been covering a lot in, in my job, um, is digital learning. It's so, sort of amazing. Uh, all the new stuff that's being created for iPads, for computers, those sort of things. So for example, um, there's this program called Dragon Box on the iPad that actually my son uses. My son is uh, just about three years old. This program uses, uh, initially it uses little pictures of dragons and little pictures of night and day to help kids do rudimentary algebra. Okay, And then over time it replaces these little pictures with numbers. Okay? So essentially this little pro computer program, it's a really fun, entertaining, is teaching my three-year-old how to do algebra. Okay. This is something that he probably wouldn't in the traditional school be able be, be able to learn until eighth grade, maybe freshman year, maybe. But he's able to do this on his own on a computer. It's pretty amazing stuff. There's tons and tons of other programs. There's a lot of people investing in this space. There's a lot of companies opening up that are working in digital learning. Here's a couple new new classrooms. They're based out of New York. Uh, talk a lot with them. They actually reimagine the whole classroom. Okay. So when you walk into a new classroom's classroom, it's not a bunch of rows with chairs. There's some kids working together at a table. There's some kids on a computer. There's some kids working alone. Okay. This is great for the teachers because what actually happens is they can get immediate assessments on how the kids are doing, and they can pinpoint where the kids are struggling. And I remember for me, thank God on anymore, but when I was in sixth grade, I was doing horrible in math. I mean, just not very good. I remember I got sent home with my mid, my mid quarter report card, and my parents were not pleased. Okay, and it's because I couldn't learn one particular thing. I was just having a hard, hard time figuring out how to do one particular thing, and it was really preventing me from going at the same pace as, as the class. These, this new technology prevents that from happening. It's mastery based. 
which means the kid cannot progress to the next thing until they learn the previous thing that they need before it. Okay? So what this means is that this technology really enables a kid to not feel like a failure anymore. Right? They're going to progress, and it allows the teacher to be the teacher that they wanted to be. I remember when I taught, I didn't have access to this technology. When you're a teacher, you're kind of torn. You, you can concentrate all your energy on the kids who are struggling really hard, but then you neglect the kids who are doing average and the kids who are really accelerating. You can help the kids who are really accelerating, but then you neglect the kids who need the, the extra help. What this does is it allows the teacher to really only teach the kids when they don't understand something, right? Why teach a kid something that they already understand? It's sort of a waste of their time. It's not very efficient. So it really reimagines what a teacher can do. There's some other places. Uh, this is uh, primarily on the college level. There's these thing, things called MOOCs. They're uh, massively open online courses. Basically, anybody in the country can take them. You guys might be interested. Uh, Marginal Revolution University has tons of classes uh, on all sorts of different things. Coursera has tons of classes. These are free classes you can take at Harvard, Stanford, great, great schools. Um, Khan Academy, I'm not sure how many of you guys have heard of that. You, if you go online and type it into Google, um, yeah. it, was, it started out as a guy who was a hedge fund guy in New York. His niece, who lived across the country, needed help on math. Okay? I think it was, I think it was uh, calculus or something like that. So he couldn't call her on the phone. It was really hard to show her how to do math on the phone, right? No visuals. So he decided he was going to do this thing on his computer where he would basically use Microsoft Paint to work out the math problems and then post them on YouTube so his niece could view it on YouTube. And what he realized shortly, shortly after doing that is that his niece could rewind it if she didn't understand something, right? When you're in class, you can't suddenly you know, pause the teacher, rewind it, and then play it back so you can try to do it again. But you can do that online. Um, and what he realized is that about a month or two after he posted this, he had a million hits. Uh, okay? You're like, wow, this is... Usually it's some person dancing or some dog doing something. It was him doing math problems on a computer. What he realized is that other people were using this program to learn. So now he has a whole website devoted to this. He's scaling these things out in, um, in city, cities across the country. And he actually did one on Illinois pensions. So that's the one I'd suggest to you if you watch. It's kind of interesting. And why am I bringing this up? Because this innovation you can't keep out of the hands of kids. This guy, uh, this guy I know who runs a school, it's called Voice Academy, it's on Chicago's west side. Brought up a good point, he said these kids walk in with cell phones and iPads, why are we telling them to put them down when they get in? They're using them all the time anyways. We should try to use them to our advantage. And what's happening is outside of the school, the kids are using these products. And what parents are going to demand in the future is that they have access to funds to purchase these things, right? To get these courses, to get the Dragon Box thing that I talked about, to get access to, to things like Khan Academy, those sort of things. And innovation eventually is going to require some sort of school choice funding system. So in 10, 20 years time, I'm not sure. So. What I'm saying is we can sort of embrace it now, see the fruits of it now, but um, in, in 10 or 20 years time, it's gonna be the way we fund education. So thank you so much, that's, that's my presentation. Feel free to ask questions. Perfect, you get to school in Arizona. Let's see. Uh, we all have some oh, I questions do. here. So, uh, yes, Travis, Dave Travis. Yeah, picking me first. Okay. Yes. Uh, I um would like to ask you. Don't you think the schools would function a lot better? Uh, if they brought back some of the older things, for instance, uh, they took the Pledge of Allegiance out of school, I thought that was very inspirational. When I went to school, when they had the Pledge of Allegiance, they used to start out with that and then sing, My Country, Tis of Thee, which 
kind of got you in the mood. Okay. And uh, uh, once they took all that out, I think that they have to lower the standards. I think that, uh, that, that uh, in other words, I think if they took things like don't you think they should de-unionize the schools? Oh. 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 Yes. Oh. <laughs> why, why do you have to ask that question? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm um, here's what I would say. On the whole, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance sort of more patriotic front. I have, I'm, I'm a big members guy. That's what they taught us at the University of Chicago. I have never read studies that show either way whether or not that helps students, right? You, I mean, you could you could test for that. You could say, oh, well, this class did the Pledge of Allegiance, this class didn't, these, these students are similar, we can compare them and see if that helps, okay? I don't see, I don't see any argument why we, we wouldn't do that. I mean, personally, for me, I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization, right? personally, for me, I think that's fine. Um, but I don't know what sort of benefit it would have on, on the students. Um, in terms of the de-unionization de of schools, um, I would say that there are certain things that we could do um, in terms of changing labor laws that could be beneficial to students. I'll name two, and they might not be popular, but I'll name them anyways. <laughs> uh, North Carolina just passed a law that uh, got rid of teacher tenure okay, in high schools, in elementary schools. Um, why is this a good idea? Why would I argue in favor of this? Um, how much do you guys think it costs to fire a tenured teacher in Illinois? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I think you could run, up, run it up to a million. Oh. Okay. Any other any other takers? Okay. Yeah. What? No. Okay. Really? So here's how much it costs. An average of $219,000 to fire a tenured teacher. Okay? That's expensive. You know, your tenured teacher has to be pretty bad in order for you to undertake that as a school district. So what happens? Over the past 18 years, 97% of school districts in Illinois have not fired a tenured teacher, not even tried to fire a tenured teacher. And you can't tell me that 100% of those tenured teachers are high quality. Okay? So what this North Carolina law does, that we, I've been talking a lot about at work, is that it offers uh, high quality teachers, those teachers who have added value to their students' educations, five year contracts. Okay, so it's five years at a time. Okay, it's a little bit of protection. Uh, lower quality teachers, so those ranked average, get two year contracts at a time. So that's the change they made there. It makes it less expensive to fire low quality teachers. Those higher, higher quality teachers, even those average teachers, don't have tons to worry about. I, I think that's sort of a misnomer that the, sometimes, the, especially the Chicago Teachers Union spreads, is that if you got rid of these things, the principals would suddenly decide to lay off 80% of the workforce. It's a pain in the butt to try to find to hire somebody for a job, to try to find the right person for the job. So I, I think that's unlikely to happen. The other thing that they did was they got rid of automatic pay bumps for master's degrees. Okay? So that's something that exists in a lot of states. There's these really complicated salary schedules. Whatever district you live in, you can look these up. Uh, usually the city websites have them. Uh, in the state of Illinois, there's an automatic pay increase for a master's degree. It's actually set in law. Okay? It's $12,000 you get paid okay, when you get your master's degree. No matter where you're at in your, your career. Okay. So why does it make sense to get rid of this? There, I've never read a study, and I've read tons of studies. I, uh, I concentrated in education policy at University of Chicago that showed that having somebody get a master's degree makes them a better teacher. Okay. The, the best thing to do if you want to have the biggest return on investment in education is to pay good teachers a lot of money. Okay? To, to, to attract those teachers to come to the profession to incentivize them to stay. Okay. So, essentially, this you know this extra twelve thousand dollars, which actually adds up to almost almost seven hundred 
uh, million dollars a year that we spend on master's degree pay bumps um, is really not a good return on an investment. Okay, it's essentially the same as sticking, putting your cash under your mattress when it comes to education. You know you have no data? Gene Harker. Yeah. yeah. No data. I can, I can give it to you if you want the data. You just said you have no data to prove this. No, he has it. No, I have it. You want, I mean, I can give you the paper if you want the paper. All right. Yeah. Gene Harker has the next question. Sure. We can pass this around. You, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your organization? Are you a 501c3? Could you name a few people on your board of directors and maybe two or three of your main uh, funders? Okay. Um, so uh, we are a 501c3. Okay. Um, our organization is headed by um, uh, somebody named John Tillman. Um, he has been involved in uh, sort of 501c3 world for a while. Uh, board of directors, I'm actually, uh, I can get you that information. I, I don't know them right off the top of my head. Um, uh, our, most of our funders are private donors, so we, we get less than 1% of our funding from businesses. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty much private donors who fund our organization. We get grants here and there, um, but it's, it's not a lot of uh, foundation support and those sort of things. It's basically I would say I think 90th percent of the people who fund our organization are based in Illinois. So some people have left Illinois and want to give us, want to you know, uh, provide donations to us so we can change the laws here. So maybe one day they can come back. Um, so that's essentially how, how that works. Thank you. Margaret Aguilar. I have two questions. One is, what is the average tuition at a private school in Illinois? And the second question is, what do you think is the ideal class size? Um, you know, I don't know the average uh, average tuition at a private school in Illinois. I, you know, in, in terms of Catholic schools, maybe? Let's use that as a proxy. Um, uh, you know, in, in Chicago, for example, they can run anywhere from about uh, Six thousand to ten thousand dollars a year. A year, yes. Um, CPS spends about twelve thousand dollars per student currently. Um, so, so that's what it is here. And I would say, so you know, realistically, a voucher program wouldn't allow a kid to attend the school that Rama Manuel's kids go to. Why? Because it costs about thirty thousand dollars a year to send your kid there, right? But that doesn't mean that it's not a worthwhile program. It's you know just because you know we wouldn't el eliminate the food stamp program because you can't buy prime rib, every year, right? It's still a worthwhile program to have. Okay, so this would this would allow students to attend um, attend a whole bunch of schools that are affordable. Um, so that's why I mean that's why I I support it. And what was your second question again? I'm sorry. Well, what is your I, uh, what do you think the ideal class size is? Ah, uh, so that's an interesting question. Um, so, I would say, you know, I, here's, here's how I would answer that. I think it really depends on what quality teacher you have in the classroom. I think a high quality teacher can handle more kids, and a low quality teacher can handle less kids. So, if I was going to put money dollar for dollar towards something, it would be towards hiring a high quality teacher and not towards reducing class sizes. What would be an ideal class size for a high quality teacher, as far as you're A high quality teacher can handle 35 students. No, I have, you know, okay, I'll deal with you. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you a teacher? A uh, former teacher? Uh, Just current no, teacher? I, 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 I teach at the community college level, but I've been involved, and I'm a nurse, but I've been involved in, I'm in the local school council, the okay. grade school that my son went to school with, and I violently disagree with you on your class size, no matter how qualified it is. Okay, yeah. okay. That's, That's fine. David, uh, my observation was, the income question that, that the children who come from higher income families perform better in school. That's right. So the problem is to, to, to change the economic system in some way 
so that, that the children, the poor neighborhoods, can live better. They would perform better. So they would see that um, when they get some work education. So what they're trying to do now is try to educate kids about all these problems at home. And parents are parents out of work. There's no father around. You can't expect that child to come to school and perform like some like some on the North Shore. And secondly, secondly, if you're going to open up twenty to all these kids, you know the American Nazis can open up the schools and say, listen, the kids want to come here. We're going to teach them what our beliefs. Okay. And don't we have something called separation of the state? Okay. Can you repeat the questions? I, I, I'll paraphrase them. So the, the first one was a, uh, basically an issue about what will really help kids, school choice or improving their living conditions. That was the second question. Oh, that was the second question. What was the first one? Class <laughs> size. How are you going to change the economic system? Well, that's the first question. Okay. Okay. Basically, the problem is, is economic and social. It's not an educational one. I, I disagree with you. Sorry. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's part of the issue. I don't think it's the whole issue. I actually think that's, that's an excuse that some people use. Um, I think that there are instances, and you've seen at good schools, where these kids from these low-income backgrounds, from these uh, families that where their primary language is in English, are doing better than kids who are similar to them in Chicago public schools and other schools across the country. Okay. That's just a fact. You see it at the charter schools in Chicago. Um, so I would say that it might it might have an effect. And I think I think that's true. But there's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do one or the other, right? We don't have to go all school choice and don't help the people have better lives and jobs and those sort of things. We can do both. But I, I fundamentally think that the sort of the foundation of an education system should be choice. Okay. And Charles, well, wait. Let me, Okay. I'll answer your question. Charles? Yeah, Josh, you had one singular statistic that charter schools students are only 10% or less performing better. I've seen the New York Times that charter schools are about equal okay. and even lower. Mm -hmm. That's not a great deal to get excited about. I mean, that's like. You, so you have a school with a guy like me in there, your score would go up 25%, you know. <laughs> You're, you are very humble. It is absolutely, what is it? I haven't dealt with statistics. It's not a significant with very variation. Sure. It's nothing. For all the transition, it ain't worth it. 10% okay. less than a 10% gain after all these years. For running scab schools, if that's all you can show, getting rid of tenure, firing at will, that's not worth anything. That's nothing. Okay. Um, so I, I think I know the study that you're referencing. It was a, uh, it, possibly, um, it was a credo study done out of Stanford. It showed that, um, what you said. It's so insignificant. Yeah, but. Look, it's a good, that was a good study that was done. It's, it um, ain't great. Okay. Well, you're using it to back up your arguments, so. Well, no, it just says 10% to me. Okay. Okay. Well, here's, here's what I would say. When you look at these big national studies, you have to look at sort of the inside of it, right? So somebody can go around saying, well, this national study showed that charter schools didn't do that much better. Okay. There's charter schools that are doing an awesome job. Awesome job in the city of Chicago. Noble. Normal right. network, for example. For every example, there's a counterexample. I'll never arrive at the truth. Okay. There's some low-quality charter schools, and they should be shut down. I agree with that. If they're not performing up to snuff, they should be shut down. Why are we sending Why are we sending kids to these schools? They shouldn't. They shouldn't be. Uh, they shouldn't be open. Now, 
some places have hesitated to do that because they're worried about how that would reflect on the charter school movement. But if our if our concern is the education of children, we should we should do that. But there are certain schools, like I said, a noble network of charter schools in the city of Chicago. If you look at ACT test scores, college ready tests, noble network of charter schools and other charter schools in the city have the, the top nine out of ten test scores on the ACT. Okay. Similar populations. Very, very similar populations when it comes to that. So they are doing something right there. Yeah, you get by in the public school as well. All right. If I was an Illinois resident and had a kid about five years old and had my choice to move him to anywhere in a state, what would be the best place to put my kid into a public school or to get him educated in a private school? What would you recommend? What do it if in the current system or in a school choice system? In, in both, actually. Okay. In, in the current system, I would say, uh, I mean, if you want sort of the most luxurious school, <laughs> public school, it would be New Trier, Will Matt Winneka. Uh, I mean, the example I always use is that they spend so much money on their kids, they have a crew team. So they have a row, they have a rowing team at their high public high school. That's usually something you just see at private schools in the Northeast or something like that. Um, so they spend a lot of money per student. So if if you could scrimp and save and buy an apartment in Wil a Wilmette or Winnetka and you had a five-year-old kid, I'd say do that. Get an address in Wil Wilmette or Winnetka. Um, in terms of private schools, I mean, there, there's a lot of good resources online that you can look at that do private school reviews. Um, in terms of if you were just relying on the voucher, like so, so you, you couldn't supplement it with your own income. I would say um, Chicago has a, a lot of high quality private schools um, that are affordable. A lot of the Catholic schools do do pretty well. Um, I would probably, if I were you, put myself around an urban center in the state um, because they have higher concentrations of private schools, so you'd have more of an option for your family. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's what I would do under sort of a school choice school choice system. But but one of the great things is. I think is that you know if, if we pass a law that allows this to happen, you don't. A lot of people won't have to move. So I've even given talks in very rural part of the state, and I'll be like, "Do you guys have private schools around?" Yeah, we do. If you were allowed to use your tax money to attend that private school, would you send your kid there? Yeah, I would. So the great thing about the school cho school choice system is that you don't have to move to send your kid to a better school. Oftentimes. Um, now, do you have children, and if you do, where do they go to school? Uh, I do. I have a, right around a three-year-old and a seven-month-old, so no school yet. Um, I, for all likelihood, I will. We will probably homeschool our kids. Um, if I had to, I, I just mm -hmm. the, the public schools around me, I don't think are up to snuff, um, and. Uh, you know, I just think that sort of the way technology is going and stuff like that, I think um, we'll, it will be, he'll be better off learning homeschooling, though that could change. I, I, I know a number of homeschoolers and the kids are turning out fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Let's see, Bob, did yeah, you get a question in? Yeah. yeah, two questions. One, do you know how much um, computers are being taught in the Chicago public schools? And the second question is, um, do you really think it's possible to motivate students from low-income bad culture <laughs> uh, society, can, can you think it's easy to motivate a student from an economically and always bad culture? Okay. Um, I think that there's a couple of schools in CPS are utilizing technology uh, pretty well. Uh, one of the sort of misnomers when it comes to digital education and stuff like that is if you just chuck an iPad in front of a kid, that's digital education. Right? right. It's not, right? Because yeah. um, they can use it go on Facebook and all those other sorts of things. Um, you really have to have a good teacher in the room or a good parent helping. Um, and you have to have a good suite of programs and those sort of things. I was asking how much computers are actually taught in the Chicago public schools. Well, not used, but taught? Do you mean like... Freshman year, sophomore Oh, uh, okay. I got gotcha. you. I'm pretty sure Chicago Public Schools has sort of a mandatory computer class, but it's not like it's not like ones you see at college. So 
for example, I took a uh, coding class which helped me design websites. And that's sort of, I took that in graduate school, but that's sort of, that was a mandatory course when I went to graduate school now. So I, I don't know how many kids at CPS are, um, are doing those sorts of courses. But what I, what I was saying is that there's a couple good examples in the system of people who are utilizing technology all around, not just in a computer class, but they're using technology for their history classes, their English classes, those sort of things. So second question, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to overcome um, when you have a, a kid coming from a single parent home, uh, somebody who maybe lacks motivation, um, and I, I don't disagree with that, so I, 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 I totally understand where that's coming from. I, I think it's really, and this is the charter schools that have succeeded, have created a good environment for that kid to thrive. They pay attention to the kid, um, uh, and I think you'll see you see that reflected in how much they appreciate school and how much uh, how well those kids are doing there. Um, so I see a number of uh, yeah. people. I would say that that that's sort of that was my answer. Feel free to ask me if you want. Uh, Andy Evans. Uh, a minute ago, you said the schools around where you live aren't public schools aren't really up to snuff. What is that area of the city? Or is it in the city? Evanston. You're in Evanston. Yeah. So the public schools around you aren't up to snuff. Can you tell me roughly, summarize, basically why aren't they up to snuff if they're public schools? I think they're really lagging behind on the embracing of technology, personally. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that schools aren't utilizing at the moment that they could be. So, for example, when I'm talking about a CPS school that does, uh, does digital learning really well, Voice Academy, it's on, on Chicago's west side. Um, just amazing stuff they're doing, and these kids aren't well met kids. They're not Kenilworth kids. Um, these kids are. I mean, when I went over there, for example, so I work downtown. Um, I had to hail six cabs before a cabbie agreed to drive me over there. Okay, so that nobody can argue that this place is a good part of town, right? So, and and when I got there, he said, "Do not go anywhere else." Go to the door, go inside, and when you get out of the door, you know, I would call me, and when you get out of the door, walk straight to my cab. Okay. So it's not in a good place. But they're utilizing, uh, utilizing really interesting technology. Um, and for example, their music class, really cool. They have a bunch of traditional instruments. So the teacher will help kids play guitar or um, bass or piano. But the, weird, the, the cool thing is, is that all of those instruments are hooked up via, via USB to a computer. Okay, so the day I was there, these kids were playing it, recording it on their computer internally, and then using a program to essentially edit the music, and they were making soundtracks to video games. Okay? So that's just a really cool way of doing things. What, what age students are you talking about? Those were 15-year-olds, um, I think? High school. Yeah, those were high school students doing that. Yeah, but I was giving a presentation last week, and I said it, it beats the hell out of playing the recorder, right? That's what I had to do in school, is play the recorder. I would have much rather had access to this technology and be able to do that. That would have made music so much more interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, I think it is who is having a child, uh, and uh, also the child is only as smart as the mother. And the, if you have only one parent families, that unless they've got help from their own family, I think they've got their hell on earth with, uh, with living in the city of Chicago. I, you have to you have to then try to get them into a private school like under St. Benedict's or Queen sure. of Angels. St. Benedict's is uh, one of the best one of the best uh, schools you could ever want to go to. Same with Queen of Angels. But they have uh, uh, parents involved, okay. and that is the that is the key to it. It takes it takes uh, uh, like they say a village to raise a child. When these were uh, when Daly broke the ethnic neighborhoods, he did it because the ethnic neighborhoods were the safest uh, uh, places to live, and the rest of the city could go to hell in a handbasket. And it was hell for the police to police it. Sure. And when you get kids uh, who uh, have, it's like beget and forget. 
and they get into a classroom, they they raise holy hell there and you can't teach. You, there are classrooms on the south side of Chicago who have police in the classroom. Okay, the question is... The, uh, well, like I say, who is having a child and what schools are they going to? Okay. To try to integrate them into schools uh, so that, uh, you know, it, it, it looks good. Test scores don't mean a thing. And that's not why you go to school. You go to school to learn. The, the, the lecture should come later. Yeah, the re we'll have a re we'll have a we'll have a, we'll have a rebuttal period that you can get at the five minutes of time. I'm a very successful parent. I, I, I no, I I agree with you that. I'm very smart. I've got two no, no, I There's, I've got a child who's got a PhD. I've got a child who's got a degree in science. You know, and yeah. you want to follow instructions. There is a time at the end of this. Okay. Whatever you want. I I I'm considering <laughs> this. You know, I have my hand up for God knows how long. I, well, there are other people with I, their hands I, up too. Right. Okay. okay. We'll give you so, plenty of time. Yeah. I, I would I would agree with you. You will. You will. I would agree with you that test scores are not everything, right? But it's really it's really hard to quantify learning other than doing that at the moment, right? Anyway, basically, what they do is they look at value added test scores. Um, so that's sort of our best proxy. I, I agree with you, though. I mean, when it comes to that, I taught. I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I taught AP classes when I was um, teaching at the school I taught at, and I would not say that those test scores are the end-all, be-all. It's a, it's a decent reflection on how well I was doing as a teacher, um, but I wouldn't say base 100% of my evaluation on it or something like that. Um, and I would say on, the, on your other question, um, I would say on your other question, yes, it is hard to motivate those parents and those students. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't condemn all of them to that. I don't think it's true about all of them. Um, it's true about some of them, yes. But just because some of them may may not utilize this system doesn't mean that we shouldn't provide it to the people who would, the people who are um, who are concerned about those kids and feel trapped. I mean, you hear stories at least once a month of a parent either paying somebody in another school district where, where the schools are better to use their address, those sort of things. So, and, and some lady from North Carolina just got tossed in jail for five years for doing that. Um, that to me is an unjust system. There's also an injustice about having kids sit in a lottery, sit in a classroom waiting for a lottery to go to a better school. That's just a I mean, I'm not sure if you guys have seen seen that movie, Waiting for Superman, but that's just a horrible, horrible thing in my mind. Um, so there are ways you could structure a school choice system to uh, maybe incentivize schools to try to get those kids who are really struggling. Um, in California, they have a weighted student funding system. Essentially what it does is it establishes a baseline level. so. Theoretically, in Illinois, it could be six thousand dollars, right? You could you could say using the same level that we currently use, and then if there's like certain risk factors that a student has, you would provide more funding based on that. So, in um, in California, um, if the kid is from a low income family, uh, the school or the student would get more money to spend at the school. I guess in the school choice system, it would be the same way. Um, if they're an English language learner, you might get more money. Um, so if these kids who are sort of at risk more for not attending school were worth more to a private school or another public school, those schools might actively recruit for those kids. Um, so that's a, way, that's a way of structuring it to maybe alleviate some of the issues that you have. Ed Reels? Um, you're talking about starting from the current school system and changing it as a like say nicely, just changing. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that in, in the, at the college level, there, there's a lot of new tools and a lot of new ways of teaching people sure. that may, as you say, that may lead to a an unschool. I agree. Yeah, it's um, possible. Yes. So, do you? Do you think that this change 
and the change being educating students, educating children to become you know, adults will be uh, from the college level down instead of what we're trying to do, which is change from day to night. You mean sort of like over time it will trickle down and be used more at the... Well, it will like be successful at one level and on sure. another. You know, I think you've already seen that a little bit. Um, in, in the places that have actually embraced sort of digital innovation and digital learning, um, states like Arizona are pretty pretty much at the forefront and they're allowing... Um, That's a real progressive place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, progressivism is not always good. Um, uh, so, uh, so anyways, yeah, they're, they're embracing sort of a different funding system to allow uh, to allow these digital tools to be used and to have customized education. That's that's kind of what you're seeing at the um, at the university level. So Georgia Tech, uh, for example, I think two weeks ago, they announced that they have a new computer science program, Masters of Computer Science program, that they've put together. They're, I think they're ranked sixth in the country for computer science, so if you're a student, you want to get in there, right? This new Masters of Computer Science program costs $7,000. And what they're doing is they're, it's all online, the entire thing's online, and they're expecting people from all around the world to sign up for this. This is a degree that is going to be recognized by people and those sort of things. It, before, if you wanted to get a computer science degree from Georgia Tech, it cost you about $56,000. So now it's seven, it was 56. So you can see how, you know, cost-wise, it's, it's helping a lot. And you could, theoretically, if there's a lot of competition, there's a strong market, there's good quality products in digital education. You could, you could theoretically see the cost of schooling go down too. You could see a lot more people homeschooling, um, those sort of things. But, but the main thing is, you know, for the people who are wealthy, right, they have access to these, they can buy iPads, they can buy the apps that go on iPads. They could probably hire, hire somebody to figure out what the correct curriculum is for their, for their kid using these, these things. But we want to be able to we want to be able to allow students from low and middle income families to have access to these things too, and that's why we want to free up the government money for them to be able to spend. Wayne. Yeah. Oh hi. Sir, uh, you were talking about Wait, say that again. Sorry. Okay. I can't hear it. He's got a heavy accent, too. Do you have to go in your area and not mean that? Oh, my up to snuff thing? Yeah. You want me to expand on that? Yeah. I mean, the, the, well, the, the, public, the public elementary and the public high school. And the, no, not Nutrier. No, it just happens. Though I, though I still think I have a colleague who sends their kid to Nutrier. And he he would argue that they're still a little behind in what they're doing, especially in terms of embracing technology. So he he said, for example, his his daughter knows Spanish really well, and she is not able to take a higher level Spanish than she's currently at. So she's reached the peak of the school. It would be great if she could have access to an even even higher level of Spanish, something where there's more immersion, those sort of things. So she's still not being challenged there when if she had access to this technology she, she could. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Paula. Oh, it's okay. Oh. The answer is... Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Good. Two for one. Great. Uh, Joe. Uh, from time to time on uh, TV news programs I've seen short segments about uh, the show uh, Magnet School Classrooms and they're all dispersed classrooms yeah. as you described first of all. Why don't we have that in all the public schools in Chicago? Um, because I really think it, it it all comes down to utilizing a lot, I mean a lot of the magnet schools utilize technology. Um, they use they use these sort of things so um, I would say that, that sort of setup is conducive to that. I mean one of the great things is that when you're a student um, if you're a student teaching other students how to learn something, how to understand something, that's really beneficial for your mind too. So that's one of the things if you look at, so remember uh, I brought up new classrooms in New York, 
that's one of the things that they do. So they have a little corner where kids are teaching other kids, and you have kids talking with people on computers. You have kids doing their own personal personal learning. So that's why you see that at magnet schools. But that I would I would say that that's probably that's the classroom of the future. Why do we not have it? For one, I think a lot of teachers are reluctant to embrace it because they worry that it's going to mean losing their job. And I would I would argue that it's going to enhance enhance their job. Uh, using this technology, it, it makes it more likely for them to accomplish more in the classroom. Um, I would say also that, um, and this is a totally different topic that you could have another night on, the quality of our education schools in the, in the United States is pretty bad. Um, so these teachers aren't being trained in utilizing these technologies um, before they're out of school. So. We need to change that too. So is it a right. monetary thing? We don't have enough money to do that in the classrooms? No, I don't think, I don't think so. I think it's a way, how do we distribute the money? I think it's what do we, what do we think is important and what, do we, what are we willing to spend on? Um, those sort of things. I don't, I don't think it's a lack of money, it's just how we distribute the money in, once we spend it in the school. Charles? Yeah, Josh, for decades, I believe the percentage of the population with a college degree hovered around 15%. And according to your program, these public schools are taking the very lowest of, of those on the socioeconomic status and 6% are getting college degrees. And you find that to be bad, or it probably could be a little better, but it doesn't strike me as anything to get worried about. That's interesting. I would say that... Um, I mean, this is the very... Demographically, they've got the... We numbers. should expect more. More? Yeah. We should expect, for example, within a year of graduating CPS. You told me a school district okay. gets $22,000. Well, the, the, the other one gets 800 or No, they 1, get six. They get 6000 That 1000 versus 22000 I'm not saying that system's right. I never said that. And the um, one with 1000 that's in the bad effect. Seem like they're doing very well. I here's what I would say to that. I, I, mean, I would say we should from a free market perspective, you're getting a better return on your dollars. I, I would say that if six percent is okay, then I guess I don't want to be right that that's <laughs> that's we should expect more than that. Yeah, we're paying one twenty third as much. Well, in Chicago, we pay thirteen thousand per student. I'll pay 1000 13000 So it's, it's not as much as Nutrier, I'll give you that. Um, but money, once you get past a certain threshold, money is not everything when it comes to education. Okay? You add an extra dollar, you can, people have studied this so much, they tracked it over time. If you look at whatever we can, uh, whatever sort of variables we can look at, it, it's not impacted by the, um, you know, increasing it from 13, 14, those sort of things. It's not a substantial impact doing that. Those, um, no, what it might get you, and I'll admit this, is higher quality teachers, right? So, but, so in Lake Forest, for example, if you attend Lake Forest School, um, you get paid, I, think the, I want to say the average for a teacher in Lake Forest is $102,000 a year. Um, for a teacher there. That's great. I think it's the best in the state. Okay, there's some parts of the state, especially downstate, your starting salary is twenty five, twenty six thousand dollars a year. It's a lot different. I can get into the pension system totally screwed up because um, it's uh, basically the, the state pays the, the pensions based on the salaries that the districts decide. So the districts don't have to pay the pensions. So 
uh, people in this poor down state area where the teachers are making $26,000 a year are paying taxes to support the pensions of the people in Lake Forest, um, even though they have no role in the decision making. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would say that personally, I would expect more out of an education system, especially when we see other schools, when we see private schools, Catholic schools who are having, who have the same sort of students and charter schools having the same sort of students, who are graduating students at a much higher rate, having higher college attendance and higher college success. And college is not everything, I would say. You basically, here's what I would want out of a high school system. I would want people to either be employed within a year of graduation or going to college within a year of graduation. You want to know something about the Chicago public school system? Uh, right around 30% of students who graduate are on welfare within a year. Okay, that is not a successful school system. So. I got one more. Uh, let's see, Janet. Yeah. Um, all the things that you're saying that you hope that um, funding the schools differently. Um, I don't see how that would change the fact, I mean, if you think that this should be more te technology in school, why can't you do it on the same system that you have? Or more of anything, or different of that? Um, I think, I, I would say that they're all sort of part of the same thing. So, I'm not getting up here and saying that if I wave a wand and school choice is in effect, that it's a panacea, that it's going to solve every issue. Right? You're going to have to you're going to have to change some uh, some of those labor laws that I talked about to, to allow uh, allow schools to hire better quality teachers to pay them more than lower quality teachers to be able to let go of low quality teachers um, easier. Um, you have to get rid of laws like Chicago has. The, um, if you are if you are a public school teacher in Chicago, you have to live within the city limits. Yeah, a ridiculous law. Like, why wouldn't you just get rid of that tomorrow, right? Because you're losing out on any teacher who doesn't want to live in Chicago, who wants to live in the suburbs, who might be high quality. Okay. That makes no sense to me to have that law in place. Um, but I would say that that, that digital, digital innovation is sort of, that's sort of more of a teaching methodology, and I think it's going to have a, a lot of impact. But there's other laws that go with school choice. What I'm essentially saying is that the competition effects that you're going to see with the school choice system is going to incentivize schools to be better at what they do because they're going to be worried about losing students. Just like if Motorola, so remember Motorola had the Razor phone and that was like the coolest thing on earth, right? And now you're like, you look back at, it, back at it, maybe some of you still have one or it's lying somewhere, it doesn't work anymore. You're like, that doesn't even have a touch screen. Like, how lame is that? That doesn't have a touch screen. And what happened? Motorola's market share went down, right? They were really struggling. They had to sell themselves to Google. Um, you know, we don't want to have an education system where, where the, there's one school that's the monopoly provider. What do monopolies do? They charge high price and they give you a low quality product. Okay? Anybody, anybody um, you know, you could argue, you know, comments, I'm a, a monopoly provider and some All people right. would say that. So, I have a question. Yes. If you're going to grade uh, teachers' pay on uh, how their students do after they graduate, uh, doesn't that reflect, I mean, isn't that affected by the overall economy or the particular economy of the community rather than uh, uh, the uh, performance of the teacher? or the uh, student for that matter. Okay. Um, I would say yes, you would you probably have different expectations depending on what community you're talking about, right? I mean, uh, um, you know, depending on what, what the economy is like there. So I would say that's true. And when it comes to paying teachers more in the classroom, like let's say based on test scores or something like that, um, I'm not one of these people who would say that teacher pay should just be on that. Right. There's a whole bunch of things. I remember when I was teaching uh, school, I think there was like 10 different points on my evaluation that I had to, um, had to you know, be quality on. So one was AP test scores. 
right? So I had to meet a certain threshold, and if I went above that threshold, I would get a bonus. Um, another one was, uh, did I dress appropriately when I taught, right? Um, another one was, if a parent called me, did I get back to them in a sufficient amount of time? These sort of basic things. So, you know, I would say that we shouldn't have an over-reliance on these sort of value-added tests, but they're sort of the best tool we have at the moment to see who's a quality teacher. Um, we can also do student surveys, not super reliable. We can do peer surveys, also not super reliable. We can do principal evaluations, which that's a whole another issue, really stink. Um, it turns out that teachers really don't know what they're doing when they evaluate teachers. Our principals don't know what they're doing when they evaluate teachers. Um, so we can use all these things and it will give us a rough idea about how how teachers are doing. Um, all right. uh, I have sure. Andy, uh, Tim, and Ed. Okay. And, oh, yeah. And uh, let's get the rebuttals soon after these last yeah, four. Time. <laughs> I can stay up all night. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. We also got a lot of people chomping at the bit to speak, Andy? too. Yes. I have a question. Um, how, how many years did you teach? And uh, when you got out of teaching, did you make more money now, or do you make a better living for less work than you did when you were a teacher? <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, your present job, does that pay more than you were making as a teacher? Well, I, I would hope so, right? I mean, I, uh, I mean, that's the reason I went to grad school and those sort of things. Um, one of the reasons. Um, so when I started teaching, um, I made, this was a BA, I got, I got my job I graduated in June of 2004, got my job in August of 2004 teaching. Um, I, my starting salary was $31,000. Okay, it's not a lot. Um, in a place like Elgin, I mean, not a lot. You can't, you got a sort of room of people. I was a high school and middle school teacher when I got out. Um, uh, so, but I think it, I think, what really matters is, and here's the thing, we could theoretically pay people more up front to entice the people who, would we, we, who we would want in. And I, you know, I could see a system that I would be in favor of if they did that, right? Because you kind of want to attract people who might otherwise do a different job, but they're higher, high quality enough that they would want to come do your job instead. Um, so, so I could see a system that, that worked like that, but I, um, you know, I think I think it all depends. I think you know we can argue about what a reasonable salary is for a teacher and those sort of things. Um, but uh, you know, I think there's a point where we would say, well, I think they make enough, and there's a point where we would say, well, I think they make too little. But in between there, I think it sort of it depends. Yeah. I guess I was asking, why did you leave teaching? Oh, okay. Why did I leave teaching? Because I came, became interested in how school systems function, and. Um, I was I got my I got my undergraduate degree in political philosophy, so I've already uh, I've always been the type of person who wants to imagine what what can be, not what is. That's why I didn't go to law school. <laughs> I went to public policy school instead. Um, so so that's why I ended up leaving teaching. It was more of a I wanted to have this sort of intellectual stimulation and, and gain those skills. All right, and uh, back to the question of class size. Sure. Um, that successful charter school system in Chicago, the Noble School. Yeah. What's their class like? Um, I want to say it's right around 20 students <laughs> per kid. So how do you? Why do you say 35? I'm not saying that every class should be that size. I'm saying if you have a high quality teacher, a high quality teacher can handle that. A very high quality teacher can handle that. You don't think the NOPO system is a good measure of what a good class size is for the problem? I would say if you had a really functioning dynamic school, you would have different class sizes for different teachers. If you could assess it and figure out um, sort of where they're at in their career and what they can handle. So you're saying it wouldn't pay to be a really good teacher? Because then you would have 35 students. We'd pay you a lot more for that for that class size. But in terms of return on investment, um, 
putting that money towards uh, reducing class size, you, you're better off spending that dollar on getting a higher quality teacher. In, in, in spite of the normal experience. Yeah, I would say in spite of that. I would say they're a good school, but I would, I would, I would not say that. And that's sort of a, if you ask any parent in Illinois, they're going to think that that class size thing is the end all be all of how to impact an education system, and I would argue that it isn't. So. Okay. Uh, David, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, has, has there ever been a, uh, a study done on comparing Catholic schools in poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. to public schools in poor neighborhoods? Yeah, there, there, there have been a couple um, done, and I think it really depends on, on the schools. Um, but the ones I've read, I would say probably probably at least two-thirds of them show a benefit from attending the Catholic school. Um, but, uh, but they're not as high-quality studies as some of these random assignment studies. So that's sort of the gold standard in academic life, um, is your random assignment studies. So I would say take it with a grain of salt. But I think that, um, I, you know, those... If you have a school choice system, it's not just the public schools that feel the pinch, it's also the Catholic schools, right? Because just because a kid decides to go to those schools doesn't mean he can't go to, he or she can't go to another school, can't go to a different school if that school is low quality. So um, it, wor it works both ways. Okay. Uh, okay, where do parents get help for kids' homework? Uh, the thing that kids I- shouldn't have to do homework at home. Well, the thing is, is that um, my uncle, yeah. I should say my, my brother-in-law had five kids, okay. and every one of them went through a good local school in Cary, Illinois, okay. and they were usually brought home about an hour to an hour, half's worth of homework every day, and some of the questions that were on his kids' programs, he usually wound up calling me on to get some information about. Yeah. Uh, no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Things like Indian tribes, things like uh, history. You know, I can specifically remember, and when when my uncle, when my nephew was in fifth grade, he had a real convoluted history book where it was all relativistic stuff, and he had no knowledge of some of the basics. I wound up going over to his home and privately tutoring for almost two nights on basic history of the United States. And what he did was he asked me, he said, how come my teacher didn't tell me this? And so where is a parent to do to go get help when their kids are, are asking questions like this and they don't know the answers? Well, hopefully if they pass the bill I want them to pass, they can go to a different school. If, if they think the teacher is really low quality and they don't like the class, they can shop around. They can eventually, if we're able to pass something like education savings accounts, they can they can figure out what curriculum works the best for them and what to what to use the money on. Um, uh, so, but I would say that if a teacher is not teaching those things, and this is a biggest pet peeve of mine, and I didn't do this when I when I became a teacher, I never used the questions at the back of the book at the end of the section. I just thought that was just the most intellectually lazy thing to do. I always created all my own questions, all my own tests, um, and those sort of things. So, you know, I think, but here's the thing, in the current system, right, you had that low quality teacher, that history teacher, your middle low income sucks to be you, you can't go anywhere, you're stuck. All you can do is, is complain to the principal, or the superintendent or whatever, hope they change, hope they fire that teacher, oh, too bad they're tenured. Cost two hundred nineteen thousand dollars to fire in Illinois. Eh, just got to wait a year, I guess. Um, we need to have a different sort of system in place, so you don't have to do that. And hopefully, and what what I was saying with uh, you know with this digital technology, if we we set up policies that embrace it, a lot of the work's going to be done at or in the classroom. Okay, it's a, it's going to be kind of flipped the way it is because the kids will be doing all the work there, and I. I mean, I would be happy as a clan if in five years, the schools that are using digital learning have no homework. Kids could go home from school, maybe they'd spend a little extra time in school, but the kids could go home from school, don't have homework, they come the next day. Because I agree, it's kind of ridiculous when 
you're asking a kid who's from a single family, low income, to go home, maybe their parents are fighting, maybe somebody's abusive, I don't know. And then, it, as a teacher, you don't often know what's going on at home, right? So, I think a great policy is make sure not all that work's being done at home. That makes a lot of sense to me. I think having it done in the school is much better because that's an environment that the kid can work in. Okay. Well, uh, let's see, Ellen has not had a question. Um, okay, when you're talking about this class size of 35, yeah. I mean, I how, are you, how are you going to address problems of, say, um, do you think a teacher with 35 students can effectively address um, issues of bullying or, or conflict resolution among sure. all, all, I mean, that's, a, that's an awful it lot is a lot of things. Time. I mean, I, I don't remember how big my classes were when I was sure. younger. There was a lot of bullying and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. going on. I don't, but I don't remember how big the classes mm -hmm. were. Yeah, so I think when it comes to conflict resolution and bullying, um, hopefully, and I know this doesn't occur at every school, hopefully there would be a, a sort of multi-step approach where you'd have multiple people working on that. Um, uh, I, understand, I understand your concern. And like I said, you know, don't, don't interpret my comments to be like, why doesn't everybody have 35 kids in a classroom? <laughs> That's not what I meant. That's not, you know, I'm not saying every class should be 35 kids. I'm saying just some of them, some of them can handle that. Um, some of, some teachers can only handle 20. Um, okay, uh, we so. have two uh, more questions. Uh, after that, I think we should cut it off and go to the rebuttal period. Uh, I'll Winnie first and then uh, Bob Lincoln first. Why don't they go to the Chicago Public Library and, and take advantage of uh, all of the scholarly books that are on the shelves? Yeah. What do you I, mean? Who? I, who? I, I was, uh, well, to, to uh, do reference work on the questions, to tear them apart and find out using the dictionaries, using the reference, using the, the uh, biographies. Why would you do that now when you go on Google and get it all online? Uh, well, let me tell you, you believe everything that's uh, out there? I do. No, no. <laughs> did you go to your university? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you know what JSTOR is? Yes. Okay. If you've got JSTOR in regard to history, you're okay. But on Google, they can crack that and put in facts that, that have absolutely <coughs> lead you down uh, up to a blind alley. You yeah. use you use references that are safe. And once you get a degree, you can go to your universities that you attended and use JSTOR and everything else that it is actual fact. But I can get it online now too if I go to the internet website. Online is not All right. safe. All right. All right. You have said that three times. We know, but I think um, I, I contend it is. I, I would say, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, feel, I mean, they can feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, you can. You, here's what I would say: if you have kids writing papers with factual inaccuracies and stuff, if a teacher's not catching those, they're not very good at what they do. So, for example, my wife had a teacher in uh, at her school in Vermont. Uh, they didn't think he was doing a good job. So, what her and four of her friends did was write the same exact paper, okay, word for word, handed it to him. Guess what? They got it back with four different grades. Uh -huh. Didn't even catch it. So you need to, you know, if, if you're worried about those sort of issues, you just need to have a teacher in place who's going to do those sort of things. All right. Uh, Bob? I was just wondering, uh, do you know how much a new teacher in the Chicago Public Schools made per year? I heard yeah. it's about approximately seventy-five thousand dollars. That's the average average salary. Oh, I thought it was a new salary, a starting. Salary. No, that's not starting salary. I thirty-two. I think it's higher than that. Do you have a? I'll have to look at the pay schedule. I'm I'm pretty sure it's higher than that. I think it's. I want to say in the forties somewhere, but um. But if you look at the pay, pay schedules, are kind of tricky things to read, because you you can't look. So the way they work is they have these things called steps and lanes. Okay. Steps are the number of years you've worked, right? So it has a list of like one through 20. 
lanes are your usually your degrees. So that's how the pay system works for education right now. You progress a year, you get a more, a more education, irregardless of whatever the quality is. You can go to some horrible, um, uh, horrible uh, education school, low quality. Uh, people don't get jobs out of it. Uh, you don't learn much. Um, you'll still get this um, a master's degree pay bump, like I was talking about before. Um, so if you ever look at one of these, you actually have to look at the first year's pay schedule, look at where the teacher is. So a theoretical teacher is to say, first year BA. Let's imagine they have a bachelor's degree. It is, for the second year, you don't look at the second year, you don't look at step two on that pay schedule, you have to look at actually the next year. And that will tell you what their actual wage increase is gonna be. Um, so it's actually really interesting because if you look at it, so like, when the CTU was in the strike, they were arguing for 16% pay increases, but when you actually include the different pay schedules, their increase ends up being more about like 30% over four years. So it's it's a lot different. Okay, let's go to rebuttals. Can I have some water? Yes, sir. Uh, we will go for rebuttals. There you go. All right. All right, let's thank our speaker. Hey, how many of you have messages of for the rest of us. Pretty good. Uh, uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you will wind up. Maybe I. Be nice. About five minutes, Bram. Uh, Eleven. All right. Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. You don't have to take all of five minutes. Okay. But on the other hand, you trespass upon somebody else's time, you'll hear from me. <laughs> well, actually, you'll hear from Tim because he has the, I have the, the I have, timer. I have a phone on the timer. All right, I there's an open mic. Let's go. I can't handle more than 35 people. Joe <laughs> Mayer. Thank you. Thank you, Brown. Um, Milton Freeman is not dead although he died several years ago, and I believe in the progressive state of Arizona, uh, he nonetheless lives on in the monetarist philosophy, which seems to imbue the uh, speaker's philosophy as well. Um, the reliance on the good judgment, in quote, good judgment of school administrators to uh, dispense with five-year contracts as in uh, Georgia or um, in charter schools where you're not permitted to, be to belong to a union or in other situations where you cannot uh, exercise your own sense of what it means to be a teacher. If you rely on the judgment of the uh, administrator, you're in, you're in real doo-doo, you know? Um, I have a doctorate in physics, I have a law degree, and I also took uh, graduate courses uh, in education at Chicago State University, which used to be called Chicago Teachers College. It was the most miserable experience of my life. Uh, these are graduate courses, the graduate mathematics course. Uh, the teacher gave you a sheet of 100 arithmetic problems which you had to complete correctly by the end of the quarter. And you had to read a book about mathematics, not a mathematics book, but a book about mathematics and make a report on it. That was graduate level education in mathematics. Uh, grad, um, science education, um, the, 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 I think there were some 30 some uh, people in the class, they were, the teacher broke us up into groups of two. Each pair, one would present uh, the essence of the subject in science, and the other would uh, give a method of teaching that particular uh, uh, subject. Uh, and it went through all, and it took the whole quarter for, to get through all of these people. No criticism was ever made of any of the uh, of, uh, correctness of the science, or especially in the methods of teaching those. Uh, it's, it's science. It was terrible, really terrible. So I agree with our speaker that uh, teacher education is really very, very bad, at least at Chicago State University and probably in many other places. Um, 
But I want to return to Milton Friedman. Uh, never mind, I won't return to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, we'll thank the speaker. Uh, very, very interesting. I think we're both interested in yeah, quality education. Uh, we might differ in what we think about quality education. And as Joe just said, uh, maybe it's because I was an example of one of those guys who went through a teacher's college. <laughs> so uh, I may not be the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer. However, uh, I have seen a lot of people that seem to have, to me, a lot of quality, and they didn't get a very good education. And uh, what is wrong with our system? Well, the speaker felt uh, underneath what he says is he has a deep belief in individualism. There are other ways to do things. You spoke of uh, Sweden, uh, Germany, these kind of places. Uh, here we talk about uh, getting ahead, you know, uh, head start. Ahead of who? Aren't we supposed to take care of everyone? No. Uh, a lot of people say no. Uh, but there are other ways of looking at it. And I would say we need to take a look at those a little bit because you get two examples. Uh, talked about food stamps. Well, you can go anywhere with these food stamps. Yeah, they're going to cut them out. They say, oh, yes, this is to take care of everybody. And then they cut it back. Same thing with you're talking education. Uh, yes, I got a master's degree. Here's how much debt I had at the end of that. Again, maybe you'd say, well, he didn't get a very good education. But right now, people are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars going into debt, hundred thousand dollars, some of them, at least one guy in my church, hundred thousand bucks in debt. Uh, and we've got a system that is based again on individuals and I guess uh, my problem is unlike the speaker I think the speaker is looking to perhaps a somewhat utopian society I don't think it's going to happen I guess I don't trust the people who run things very much thank you since I come very late I uh, have to apologize to the speaker because I didn't hear the whole thing. Uh, however, I have the impression that being uh, graduated from the University of Chicago, you have the emphasis of uh, Milton Freeman and others uh, with this uh, ideology of uh, free enterprise and, and pay for everything that you, that you receive uh, and left behind anybody who couldn't afford it and couldn't afford it because the situation or the system have put them in that way to begin with. So uh, I don't think this is an improving system. It's a system that is in unstable situation. That means any forces will tend to destroy it. Uh, instead of being a stable system where forces are trying to stabilize it. Uh, I don't think this is sustainable. <laughs> And uh, I think we will see the results of the uh, mess we are in soon uh, for many reasons. For example, we are not investing in the infrastructure that will support the society as it needs to be supported. We are not um, uh, regulating the um, industries that are destroying the environment. Um, we, we are making a mess of this, of this country of ours and of this world of ours. Um, there is a disconnect between the uh, corporations making profits and the damage that they produce in doing these profits. And the profits are going to go one way, which is up, 
and now being distributed fairly uh, to produce a long-term sustainable society. Uh, one of the latest things that we are finding is that by, uh, by the method of fracking, uh, we are bringing up to the surface uh, radio radioactive radium, and since this, uh, uh, at the levels that is coming, is considered if it comes from a nuclear reactor as a radioactive waste, high level radioactive waste, but because the uh, corporations and the companies who are doing the fracking uh, don't want to do that, they are. Uh, being allowed to dump it in municipal dumps, the radioactive waste that otherwise would be uh, something that had to be stored in a radioactive waste with the re uh, 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 relevant uh, protections against these things spreading into the uh, uh, environment, whether aquifers of air or rivers or lands. Uh, it is a mess. It's a mess that we will pay for of course, we will pay, you and I, not the people who are benefiting from avoiding these regulations. So the system is corrupt. And by corrupt system, trying to impose the same kind of rules to fix the education is a corrupt way of doing it. By making private schools as a solution to a problem that is so pervasive and so deep is, is kind of getting deeper into the problem. Uh, one of the things that they're trying to do by privatizing is break the unions. That's what they're after so they could make money on it. Uh, they might give somebody a voucher to go to a school, but it's maybe one-third of the cost of the school. And once somebody gets into these privatized schools, if they don't do very good, they kick them out right away. <laughs> so the trouble is, when you do privatization, you can see what happens to our economy. Economy goes down, 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 down. Like you said, people own uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for these schools that they can't pay off. They can't even get a job. So the main thing is to have a government program that puts people to work and they can afford to go to uh, school. I think schools should be run by the government. We done pretty good after the Second World War when the government sponsored the GI Bill. And you got a lot of people that uh, previously, under the Depression, were very poor, and then they were able to get an education, and that, that lifted everybody up. But if you have what he's talking about, everything will just go down. Uh, somebody here earlier this evening mentioned that uh, a uh, person from a poor family uh, could not be expected to do as good in school as someone from an affluent family. I believe they mentioned, uh, specifically, they said someone from the North Shore. Uh, the, uh, I want to point out here that the affluent do not do good because they are affluent, but rather they are affluent because they do good. Why don't you shut up? <laughs> now, if I can be allowed to continue, one fool at a time, I'm told, I wish that would be respected. Uh, the fact is, 
In a word, it's called application. The rich are rich because they applied themselves. They set goals and they, uh, once again, please, they set goals and they, they devote themselves to those goals. Uh, I have yet to see an inventor who just snapped his fingers and invented something. Usually they go through a great deal of, of uh, trouble getting it put together before they do it and make it work and uh, become successful with it. Uh, no, in a, in a word, it's application on the part of the individual. Uh, and uh, in, a, in the poorer areas, they're poor because if you go into their homes and their apartments, you see beer cans laying around. Mom's got a can of beer she's nursing while she's doing the ironing, if oh, she's doing boy. the ironing. And they're, uh, they're in, they have a different ethic, and that ethic ruins it for them. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Is there evidence of your kids? My name is Andy Anderson, and uh, I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine, and my hobby is translating books. For any of those of you that don't know that, uh, take 10, 15, 20 books on a subject, a massive database and translate that mass into a one-page cliff note. Uh, I, I learned that skill from my physics teacher in high school. That's where I got started as a junior. Uh, we have a book open, a physics textbook. It was incomprehensible to most of us. And he would call on one of us and say, say, Miss Jones, um, can you translate that for us into language that can be stood by, understood by your average gum-chewing American? <laughs> what does that mean to your average gum-chewing American? You know, in plain English. And so, uh, since I got out of the Vietnam War in 1970, I've read everything I could get my hands on on certain kinds of subjects. And since 1975 or so, I specialized in blacked-out subjects. Things that reporters can get fired for writing about in the United States. And in the last few years, the last six years, I've given a dozen talks here, about two a year, on various different blacked out subjects that show uh, the media, the ma Amer ma American media, maintain people in America, conscientious, well-meaning people in a state of terrifying ignorance on certain subjects, uh, a mythological bubble that's beginning to resemble that program on television that's new, it's called Under the Dome. If you, you know, it's on Monday nights, I think, it's a science fiction thing about what would a town be like if they just dropped a big glass dome over it and nothing penetrates, no information, nothing goes in or out. Well, in America, we've reached that point where the media will promote a certain kind of myth, like the myth that if you privatize schools, the students will be treated better than they would in public schools. It's a total myth. Um, the points I, I try to make uh, real quick. I uh, ran across, there's a new book called The New Jim Crow. It's talking about mass incarceration in the age of color blindness. Today you don't tell an African American or a brown person, well we can discriminate against you because you're not white. No, you can't do that. We say, we can discriminate against you because you're a felon. You, you spent a little time in prison. We have a pipeline of schools feed African-American and brown people right into prison for minor offenses. They come out a year or two later and they have a label. It's not the crime of the time, it's the label. And uh, the prison building program is taking the place of money that used to be spent on public education and public housing. They declined the amount of money that's available for, to help people that have problems with their rent and everything and they've spent that money on prisons so that we have a prison industrial complex today that's growing, it's the biggest on earth. We have the most incarcerated people. Martin Luther King said, before he died, he said, nothing is as dangerous, nothing in all the world is as dangerous as 
sincere stupidity, and conscientious ignorance. <laughs> well, think about that. I, the term I've been using is TC opera. Somebody stands up and any microphone says the earth is flat, well, you say, you're either terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts, you're certifiably insane, or you're a prostitute on somebody's payroll. The book Predator Nation has a whole chapter in there on intellectual uh, universities, the, the ivory tower they call it. Professors are paid to produce, they're paid a lot of money to use the, um, the, the, you know, the prestige of the university to put out a study saying, well, there's no evidence that nicotine's addicted, or there's no evidence that uh, owning more guns has anything to do with violence. Uh, the idea of fixing schools by going private, which means for profit, is exactly the same as fixing the crime in America by privatizing the prisons and letting them make a profit off of people and pouring money into building more prisons. Doesn't, doesn't address the problem that we have. Low quality and high quality teachers is code speak for the right to work states like North Carolina, which means right to work for less. Teachers, you know, especially teachers working with kids, teachers shouldn't be forced to work in an atmosphere where they're subjected to the mentality of the Hunger Games, that famous movie of a couple of years ago, where it's survival of the fittest. You know, anybody, any employees working under those kinds of conditions are not going to be optimizing, uh, you know, their skills every day. That's capitalism 101, survival of the fittest, and everybody else just falls by the wayside. And it's opposite of what they teach in other countries. Uh, our speaker had several times to correct the statement that a good teacher can handle maybe 35 students where a poor teacher can handle less. I've been a volunteer coach for the last 19 years working with 7th and 8th graders, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I work with a lot of teachers. And it's fundamental, documented reality that the more students you get together in an area, the crosstalk and the noise level goes up, right? And so as you, the idea, I would just say the idea, the very idea that a good teacher can handle 35 students is so far out of touch with observable, documented reality of the basic laws of human nature and how people interact, that it should be considered a right-wing talking point from the billionaire predators that right now, like the Koch brothers and the Walmart owners, who have been financing an attack on poor middle-class people in this country for the last 35 years. The middle class is heavily under attack. 30% of graduates, here's a, 30% uh, the, the of graduates, it was said, end up on welfare after uh, one year out of high school, is that right? Well, that is one of the prime reasons for that is there's no jobs for those kids in Chicago. 60,000 factories have been moved out of our country. I give us another year. We see a group of college graduates coming out of college next year, a year from now, coming home to live with mom and dad because the jobs aren't in America and you can't get a nice job in India or China. They, they got families over there that say, we take care of our own first. We get, we're, we're running a great credit hour scam on our students right now. It's been going on for several years and it's recognizing that, making profits off students, lying to them, saying, if you spend all this money to get credit hours, you're going to get a good job when you get out of college. Well, the jobs aren't in America and you wouldn't know that from the mainstream media, but you know it from talking to people in Michigan, in Detroit, in Wisconsin, and others, and in Chicago, where areas where they used to have factories that employ blue collar, white collar, pink collar, manager, all kinds of jobs, those jobs have been recreated in other countries. The job creators of capitalism, they've been creating a lot of jobs. They created millions of jobs as mirror image, like uh, you know the plants like Stanley, Black & Decker, uh, Leviton, uh, electrical parts. These, these have American quality. It's, they're made on American machinery, but the machinery was dismantled here, like the Sensata Auto Plant, moved to another country, and put in a new building, and then 12 million people lost their jobs here. 12 million people over there got employed running the same machinery for a tenth of what they pay American workers. You know, poor students, poor schools and poor students exist in areas that are being targeted by the new Jim Crow laws of discrimination. 
there's massive discrimination against black and brown people in this country, and it's they say, well, we're colorblind. No, we're not. I'd say if you want to read a history of what's going on in America right now, get a copy of this thing, The New Jim Crow, written by Michelle Alexander. Final two points I'd make, well, the idea that the rich in America got rich because they applied themselves is so far out of touch with observable reality that you want to know where that person has been living and uh, if they've been in a bubble with no exposure to media or any kind. But I understand that people's memories begin to fade as they get older. It's human nature for your memory to fade when you're off the off the firing line. If you're not on the assembly line anymore, you say, oh yeah, a good man can crank out 42 widgets where it just used to be 18 per hour. When you become a manager, you forget what it was like to be involved in that reality. Any attempt to fix our schools without facing the reality of the infrastructure under attack by the billionaire predators that amounts to complaining about individual bee stings without going after the nest. You know, it, it, or it, it, trying to cure individual cancer cells while the tumor is just getting bigger and bigger. We have to face the reality of why these schools are failing, not just turn them over to private for-profit enterprise. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, many of you may not like what I'm saying, but I'm speaking from my own personal experience. There are a lot of teachers, a lot of professional people in my family, and uh, I think that they, when you talk about teaching, like I said, you have to prepare the child. It's got to come from the parents, or, the, or uh, like I say, the child is only as smart as the mother. Uh, it, it, it's uh, a 24/7 job, and they're like, it's, I, uh, again, it's the wrong person is having some of the, the some of these children, and then they send them to school. And they rely on the teacher to teach them what they should be learning at home, and and uh, I think 20 is uh, the ideal size for uh, teaching uh, in in the schools because. They, you don't know whom you're going to get in your classroom. Um, I, I really think that they should do more intensive uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, teaching children who have problems to, to give them special help, but, but not to interfere with a normal uh, class. So that's, that's my say on things. Uh, very good. All right. Okay. Here comes Jesus. There. I, uh, I must confess that uh, <clears throat> what agitates me at the moment is uh, article I read, I read uh, in the reader by uh, Ben Karofsky about the Englewood neighborhood. It's one of those neighborhoods that's lost a number of schools. <coughs> and it's about to get a big expansion of the freight yards. Uh, and uh, the uh, the diesel fumes uh, from uh, trucks and, uh, you know, I remember uh, one of my uh, classmates in seminary uh, who was from the south side uh, and uh, he spoke with uh, a rather nasal uh, because he had breathing problems, you know. Uh, he came from the south side where there were steel plants 
and they polluted like uh, crazy. Uh, and uh, coal plants uh, for our electricity and so on. And you would think that there was some sort of greeting of America, or at least in Chicago. <laughs> but apparently that's not happening. And when you see the number of schools in the south and west side, which have been closed, 50. <laughs> The defunding, the de housing, the de destruction of community, of education, which is the essence of community. Why do people go to a neighborhood? Because it has schools. Why do you buy a house? Because you've got kids. You want to have a life. Well, and, oh yes, we're all going to homeschool all our kids. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, wages have not gone up since 73, though productivity has. Productivity has gone up way, but wages not. Who's getting all that money? Where does it go? Where does the wealth go? It might found, it might fund some foundations for the study of education or you know, what makes for good government or uh, Or the economy. Yeah. yeah, we have lots of such funding. And I wonder, you know, last week I mentioned that there was a, a, a meeting at the, uh, the Marxist Humanists uh, News and Letters publication. Was anybody here, did anybody here go to it? I couldn't go. I'm homebound because I have somebody dependent on me. But, well, how do you shape a new society? A society which is concerned more for everybody's well-being than for all those significant achievers who really apply themselves <laughs> and happen to come from wealthy neighborhoods that can invest in uh, their public schools and their housing and so on and keep the riffraff out. to take North Carolina as a real beacon in, in the age, they need to remember that one of their enlightened uh, legislators passed a law making it illegal to establish Sharia law there, even though I think probably their percent of Muslim um, citizens was less than 1%. So I'm not sure, and I, I will admit that uh, many states have passed equally idiotic laws but I, I'm not sure, not to mention, uh, was that the one where the, the governor was hiking on the Appalachian Trail, but instead he was in Argentina? Oh, that was South Carolina. Okay. <laughs> 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 
You know there's something in the water over Argentine there. Argentine you know women are something are else. Something else. Okay. I tell you. <laughs> Church schools in the voucher program have been described as the cruelest form of social triage. I, um, I have to say that this is one of the very few times that I totally agree with, with the total speech that Andy did. I think he really nailed it right on the head in terms of, of uh, the, the, kinds of, the kinds of things that are happening socially now. I often don't agree with him, but tonight I really did. It's, there have been studies of the charter school system, and of course this doesn't take into account vouchers, but one that just came up on my little whatever. Um, Stanford studied 2,400 charter schools in 15 states and found that at least 80% of them were the same or worse than the public school system yeah. in those states. Um, charter schools in the Southwest in another very extensive study that I uh, sh uh, saw that I looked up a few years ago when I was fighting with Bob Matter over this, who has somewhat the same attitude that you do about it, actually show that they're really segregated people according to their rate, or according to their skin color. That most of the kids in the in the so called in the charter schools were white kids and most of the kids in the public school turned it out turned out to be Mexican American kids. The the charter schools are notorious and in fact it's true they don't have the facilities because they can't have the facilities for the kids who have special education needs for kids that are disabled. They, they're in uh, school buildings or, or whatever buildings. They don't have an elevator for kids that are in wheelchairs. They don't have um, extra teachers that are needed for special education needs. And um, the, t the average teacher stay in, in charter schools is four years. So that means that you probably have a small group of teachers who are staying there for a longer period of time. But most of the teachers come in and teach for one or two or three years, and then they leave. And so you don't have a real large group of, um, of experienced, qualified teachers in, in, in the charter schools, which is probably one of the reasons that 80% of them do the same or worse than the public schools. Um, it, it really, I think it was even, a, it, in fact, I read that it, it was a court decision in one of the state Supreme Courts um, that funding schools for, pro, for property tax, with property taxes from the local areas is inherently inequitable. But for whatever reason, None of the state legislators can come up with an equitable way of funding public schools. And the fact that we've designed this dual system that discriminates against children based on their social and, edu and, and an economic class, that discriminates because they, they have parents who are either unable or, or, or not there, and are unwilling to get involved in their education because that truly is one of the mar one of the markers that the, if parents are involved, the kids do better. That's just known and, and that's documented in research. But if you have a group of parents who either come from a cultural background where that's not what you do to be involved in your child's education, or you have a, a single parent family where the parent is working all the time and not able to be involved or you have somebody who's educationally not able to be involved or you have a grandma who's taking care of her grandchildren and she doesn't have the energy to be involved then you have a, a, a huge number of kids who are basically discriminated against because their parents can't be involved in the schools and they don't have any way of of seeing that there are alternatives for them. But when you take money away from the school system, because charter schools takes money away from the public school system, you don't have this other fund out there that says for charter schools. You suck it out of the public school system. Then you're taking money, and then you have motivated parents because they got their kids into charter schools. And, th and then you have motivated parents, and actually that's why the magnet schools can be better because they, you, have, you, have to, you have to apply for a magnet school in this city 
earlier than you have to apply for college, and I'm not kidding. You have to apply January before your kid turns five to get into kindergarten. Now, I don't know how many people really think about that unless they're really oriented to that. But it's, that's, you know, you have to be a really on top of things parent to do that. So um, then the other thing that I want to say is you talked about the noble schools, and you talked about Nutrier, which is actually a public school. But in Chicago, there are some excellent public schools. My son went to Lincoln Park. They have an international baccalaureate program in their high school. At Lincoln Park High School. And that's one of the top rated schools in the nation. They have more advanced placement AP classes in that school than any other school. They always make the top 10 or the top 20 in the, in the US News and World Report or whoever, the business magazine that evaluates public schools. The other place that Whitney Young always makes those lists also. They have an excellent record. Uh, our, our prep schools do, uh, Northside Prep, the, um, the uh, well, I can't think, there's four or five other schools that are really excellent public schools. And within the other public school, the one, Lane Tech is another good one. They have a huge student population, but they, they have been able to really improve their educational outcomes and work with their students. Now, as far as the No Child Left Behind thing, they uh, our, our epitome of, pub, of education, George Bush Jr., um, who really should probably not have been able to, he, I, he, probably, he wouldn't have gone into college at all if, he, if his family hadn't been important. Um, they passed all these regulations that you had to do with No Child Left Behind, and they did not fund any of them. So to hold them for standards that if it were established by the No Child Left Behind Act is really not very fair at all. Um, in fact, uh, you know, to pass all these regulations and then and then say, well, you know, you have to do this, but we're not giving you any money to do this, and we know you don't have money to do this, but you've got to, you know, pass these things that are that that if you do all this stuff, you, your students will be able to do. You know, that's just um, stupid. Okay, um, so I guess that's probably most of what I wanted to say, except for class size, which you really stuck your foot in your mouth <laughs> with. And that is because it's not just the teacher that's in that classroom. It's also the students. If you have 35 high-performing students from families where the parents are involved, and all the students in that class are from the same language background and from the same socioeconomic class. That class, and the teacher is very motivated and has a lot of experience and is a good teacher, that class is going to do well. But if you, I want you to find any classroom in the Chicago public school system where all the students come from the same language background and all the students come from the same socioeconomic class and it's at least middle class or above. And you're not going to find that. And so when you have the range of, of, of students that you have in any classroom, except for maybe in East whatever, Iowa, where it's a rural area and you have 14 kids in a one-room classroom and there are all these grades, you know, that's a different thing. But in, in, the, in the city schools, you're not going you, you're going to find an enormous variety in students and their educational preparation, and even in, in uh, special ed, in, in number of special education students, we have a commitment as a public school system to deal with all the students, not just the cool ones, not just the ones that are going to make a success of it. So that is my diatribe. Thank you very much. I think what all of you are forgetting on this whole public school debate is what other countries do with their educational systems. We have in our country a real disparity deal because of the local school district funding formulas around the various things. The suburbs have their own, the uh, city has their own, but most of the countries have a national system of funding, they have a national type of curriculum, and they have a lot more standardization of their schooling systems. 
It used to be said that when you were in the, the communist countries in the former Soviet Union, you could get a good education. And in, in some sense, the public school model has been around since the 15th century. And the reason why we have the public school model is it works. Our problem is I think we have too much bureaucracy and not enough education. I can tell you from experience, my mother was an eighth grade English teacher for well over 20 years. And she said the big problem is that most of the funding and the money in the public schools goes to central administration, goes to duplicative funding, goes to a lot of different programs that are duplicative and not responsible for what actually the public schools need to be done. And she said, she even told me the property tax methodology is not the best way to fund a public school system. She said the one thing that you do need, and I kind of frankly agree with her and my father both on this issue, is that there some needs to be some form of nationalization of the educational system. Not that I'm advocating anything, but there needs to be some kind of floor involved where you have standardized curriculum across the country, uh, some kind of uh, funding formula that provides equity for the public schooling system, and then if you want to send your kid to a private school, you have that option available. Now, the other thing that there has been a lot of innovation in online education, a lot of innovation in, in getting kids going to school, but why is it that it's so much cheaper in Africa to educate a kid and he can still get the same level of performance and it's so much more expensive here in the States? How come it is so much more expensive in the States to get the same health procedure that would cost maybe 10 times less in, say, uh, a country like India? The difference is that we all know that fire departments used to be privatized. Now they're supported by your tax dollars. There are certain functions that need to be privatized, like for example restaurants and the industry and, and everything else. But sometimes this whole methodology of privatization is not the best way to do things. And sometimes the economies of scale and national policy need to take precedence. I, don't remember a lot about Sputnik because I wasn't in, involved, but the reason why the United States had such a big emphasis on science and education is there was some competitive juices flow because of the Russians revolving a satellite around the world. And we took an emphasis then on math and science in the early 60s and 70s. Now, I don't think kids are any dumber than they were back in the 70s. I don't think kids or programs or whatever, any dumber now than they were. It's my contention that kids are a lot smarter today than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And the mere fact that they can understand electronics even far better than I can do is, <laughs> is one emphasis on it. I really, think, I really think myself that the one reason, the one area that we're neglecting in all of this is what's happened to the American family and, and some of the problems it's been having. If you look in a study that was done on the Truman administration, they said the largest contributor to poverty in America was the single parent household. There is not enough people taking responsibility and raising families in a traditional manner than there was even 40 or 50 years ago. The second thing is that we as the United States have fundamentally changed our capitalistic system. We're no longer a capitalistic nation. We're more of a, what we call a mercantilist society. We no longer build things in America. We are more emphasized on the equity produced from intellectual capital and farming it out overseas than we were actually to applying it and building things. And for me, the one, two things that I think the, that would bring the country back online is to do what China is doing now with their economy because they're doing exactly what we used to do. They use government investments to get the infrastructure built and then they turn that private infrastructure over to corporations to make the profits on it. That's how it worked with the internet. That's how it worked with the railroads. The railroads didn't get a free ride. They got land grants, they got various things and there was a lot of things. 
if we go back to building things and get back some of the cooperative spirit that comes from a good community with stable families, I think we're on our way. Oh yes, and one of the reasons why they've been closing schools in the Chicago area, have you taken a look at the demographics recently? There's less people in Chicago. There's less children to educate. And perhaps that might be a reason why they're closing some of the bloated infrastructure. Population, I read the other day in Chicago went up. It's mostly yeah. older people though, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thank you, Josh. For, uh, it's a very nice, informative PowerPoint you put together, and um, for handling some of these issues. Please come again. <laughs> when you, get, you, I'm not actually. I'm going to be eclectic. I'm going to. I'm going to leave you alone. I got enough ammunition right here. <laughs> Fire away, Let's Charlie. See here. Um, I will talk about, all right, I'll start off with you, the supermarket thing. Uh, in my neighborhood, they, uh, yeah, the, the, the guy who owned the land, the Chinese guy, I got in a dispute with Dominic. So Dominic's moved out. We didn't have a supermarket. And actually, I've always said, I'd really prefer to have a people's food depository like number five that I could go to once a week and get basic food. I'd be, I'd be perfectly satisfied. I think that's a wonderful idea. Much better than the free market capitalist system that abandoned my neighborhood and they didn't care if we had food or not or were inconvenienced. So given the government run food distribution system, and it would also ensure that everyone had an adequate diet and minimal requirements of nutrition. The, free, the Dominics didn't care. They, this, and that Chinese guy who thought he was going to build some apartment building or something, he didn't care. But anyhow, it takes care of the supermarket thing. Um, actually, in my neighborhood, I'm still known, I still don't do it anymore, but I'm I'm known around the hood as teach, because I would tutor students. Um, largely, I ended up with teaching college students. I just remodeled my apartment. I put my, I had a blackboard in my house, and I left it in the front yard. And my my neighbor stole it. I caught it. <laughs> I said, "You can have it if you want it, that bad, you know." Uh, I made him give me back the other stuff, though. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, regarding this uh, computer learning, uh, I don't understand this. I'm a little confused here. You think you, you want children to be taught by some robot? <laughs> Mr. Pumpkin does algebra or something, you know? What kind of learning is this, you know? And you're entirely correct. You, you were ahead of me here. Instead of getting into your, all your online thing, why don't you take a walk to the local public library and see a guy like me and say, are there any good books you could <laughs> recommend? You know, do that once a week and you don't need, you know, soft laptops, uh, things like that. Uh, it, it's the people's university, things like this. I think we've got to avoid, my name heard some of the Chinese, they, these people are really, Adherence of Confucius, man, they're education driven. And you got to be careful about not getting in, crossing the line uh, to the extent that they are with these cramming schools and things of this nature. Um, you know, the, I'm amazed. This is the first time we've had an evening on education and not talked about how schools uh, stifle creativity. What happened here? It doesn't seem to be the issue anymore. Um, purpose of schools, I think, is to instill discipline, to make you sit down, shut up, and listen. Uh, if you can achieve that, I mean, that's that's the thing there. Regarding class size, I, I don't really think the numbers that you choose are been established. Certainly, more focused education can be customized. That's inherent to it, 
but I've always thought the major variable in education in terms of classes were homogeneous versus heterogeneous grouping. It has always been the uh, major variable that went into that. Um, basically, your better performing students segregated from the less, uh, if you wish, um, performing students. Regarding uh, this teacher contracting, I've never heard of a more nefarious. This is the absolute darkest <laughs> type of working arrangement, two-year and five-year contract. The reason they want contracts, boys and girls, is that you have absolutely no appeal rights. Now, there's one thing inherent to education that's a little bit different than other professions. If Johnny cannot read, guess who's, who is responsible for that? The teacher. And the, you seem to forget there had to be some, some barriers, something to stem that, that the teacher was not held accountable for circumstances well beyond his or her control. And yes, you're going to have people that will say fire them because Johnny did not learn how to read. And you can have Socrates here and Johnny's not going to read sometimes. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you can try what you want and you're just not going to be able to succeed under all circumstances. We're talking about some rather complex process here. But that absolutely categorically would eliminate this contract thing. You, you really would discourage people from going anywhere near that as a profession here. Let's see, that's, that's just about it. Uh, anyhow, thank you very much. Oh, regarding class size, one other thing. I, and I don't know if this is relevant or not. In college, we used to have, we used to have diff both in a course. And by, by the way, I don't think this online courses have picked up on academic things. They were a big thing 10 years ago. So no, one's, no one's even using them, I don't think. So I, I gotta wonder about your online stuff. There's just no interest in many departments. I know, I just came to thinking in labor education and it wasn't even, the conference, it wasn't even discussed. Maybe 10, they said a big years ago it was a big rush to get these courses. And no one, no one's taking, using them. But no, and I had a course um, where we, once a week we had a large auditorium with lectures by the distinguished scholars in certain subjects. And then we had two classes which would be limited, like you say, to 20 people and things like that. To be quite honest with you, I certainly enjoyed those auditorium lectures, you know, mm -hmm. mainly because the teacher in the little class used to give me, man, one heck of a hard time. <laughs> but maybe that's my own fault. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. well, come again when you got another one in you. Speaker gets the last word. <laughs> Speaker gets the last word. <laughs> what time do I get? <laughs> you get up to yeah. 11 o'clock. And the restaurant blows us out of here by 11 o'clock because they want to go home. Oh, I don't need that much time. Well, then go ahead and close us out, please. Okay, so um, that 35 teacher statistic that you guys uh, have talked a lot about, that actually came from a Center for American Progress study. So, I mean. Center for Progress. <clears throat> so that's that's where that came from, just to let you know. Um, the ch I, I'm trying to think of what was said. Um, in, in terms of the charter school populations, they I, I will say I think it's about 3% less special ed students. Um, this is in the city of Chicago. Um, I'm, and this is just, sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, so I can't. Um, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, ELL students is pretty similar, maybe a percentage point less. Um, the uh, racial demographics are fairly similar too in the in the charter schools. So, 
I would argue with the fact that they're not utilizing the same or having the same students. Uh, I mean, public schooling in and of itself in Chicago is disproportionately utilized by um, Hispanics and African Americans, right? Um, arguably, the city is more segregated than it was, and I'm, I'm not sure if somebody brought this up than, it, than uh, when Brown versus Board of Education was decided. Um, and I, I want to say, if I remember correctly, some of the older older statistics, and this was like five years ago, said that um, there's a, only 9% of the white population in the city uses the schools, and um, of that 9%, 90% of those kids attend similar schools. So it's all clustered in one area. Um, probably on the north side is what I would assume. Um, so some of the other stuff. Uh, you know, I... <laughs> I would say that um, <laughs> here's a couple of things. Just because I went to the University of Chicago doesn't mean I adhere to everything that its major thinkers said. Whoa. So I, I would not assume that. Um, making that assumption, uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't sort of grant me the depth of thinking that I give you guys. So. Uh, um, you know, I would I would say that. Um, I would also say that just because somebody supports something like school choice, uh, you know, doesn't mean that they are adherents to free market philosophy, all sorts of stuff. I work with plenty of different people. Actually, yeah, you know, there's a few Chicago Democratic representatives that if I'm trying to introduce a bill in Springfield and trying to work with them on a school choice bill, they're the ones that are going to introduce it. Okay, Senator Meeks in 2010 introduced a school choice bill for, um, for Chicago students in the city's worst 10% uh, of schools. Okay. Because he wanted subsidies for religious programs. Okay, maybe. You might yes. be, yeah, yes. I, could, I could see that. But guess how the vote played down? Okay, Senate, Democrats. More Democrats voted for the bill than Republicans did in the Senate. In the House, more Democrats voted for a bill because of, or, than Republicans. In actuality, if they would have had a few more Republicans vote for it in the House, the bill would have passed. It probably would have been signed. So, and I, in my daily life, I, um, in my working life, I'm, I'm more likely to work with people who are liberal than, than conservative when it comes to this issue. So it's not, it's not just a sort of Milton Friedman guy, Alec, um, Koch brothers, whatever thing people think it is. Um, what drives me is the fact that I have seen this current system persist for a long time. I see it producing poor results, and I think trying something else, and like I said, it's not a panacea. I'm not saying implement this school choice system, allow families to send their kids where they want. I'm not saying that this is overnight going to change everything. But I think it's a necessary, necessary thing to have, um, along with other, other changes. Um, and I think, you know, if, if, you know, uh, if, you, if you're saying, here's what I would say, if, if, if the status quo is sufficient for you, um, there's, there, there's an issue there. Um, okay. Um, and I would say that, um, yes, doing some of those things that, um, that may help families have a better quality of life might work, but you've got to be aware of, this is sort of outside, a little bit outside of education, you've got to be beware of uh, the quality of those things, right? So, um, for example, on this, um, I'll talk a little bit about Medicaid right now. Um, how long do you think it takes for a doctor to get paid in this great state of ours um, when, when somebody comes to them for Medicaid. Yeah? It could be years. Three yeah. to five years. Okay. I've heard even as long as ten years. So, um, in actuality, I think it's about 1.5 years for a doctor to get paid. Um, and guess what the, the state just did? They expanded Medicaid. Okay? So that means that instead of 1.5 years, it's probably going to be three years. And they're actually doing a, uh, trying to see who's, who's income eligible and all this sorts of stuff under the current program right now. And they're finding that there's um, 
there's a couple people who are receiving Medicaid uh, in Illinois who actually don't live here anymore and they're using it in other states. And what taxes um, are you going to raise? <laughs> what taxes are you going to raise to pay for that? Yeah. I'm just saying that you've got to be aware of the quality of the system that you're handing people within the political realities that you live in. Right? And you also have to be aware, and this gets to the general idea of taxation, that um, people react to taxes. It's not a simple, it's not a simple multiplication problem. And um, prime example is Detroit. Detroit installed a personal income tax at the city level. Okay, how easy is it to evade that tax and move? Pretty easy, right? Federal tax is a little harder. I got to move out of the country. State tax is a little easier than a federal tax. I just got to move out of state. So what's happening in Illinois? Businesses are moving out of the state. So you keep raising the taxes, they're going to keep moving. Unless you use some of your tax revenue to build a wall around there and fortify it. They're going to move. That's the political reality of what's going to happen. So, you know, and I've written a lot about this, you know, the CTU has this just, I, I would say, amazingly naive revenue plan that they want to use to fill in the um, to fill in the deficit. It involves a, uh, a transaction tax CME group, um, which CME has no money, so they won't move. Um, and it involves a local income tax. So you know, it works so well in Detroit. You know, it's a ghost town now that that you know we should really implement it here. I'm sure people won't move because of that either. Um, and I would say, you know, we, we talked a little bit, you know, somebody talked a little bit about population loss. Yeah, it, it's occurring in the west and south sides where those schools are closed. And guess who's leaving? Minorities. Because the schools are bad. They're moving because the schools are bad. They are going to the suburbs because the schools are bad. Okay, so what I'm proposing here and what I argued for is a change that I think will Maybe not immediately, but over time, will help improve the school system. Before you leave, give us your website and how people can get a hold of you since okay. this is going out on the internet. Sure. Um, so the name of the organization I work for is the Illinois Policy Institute. If you want to learn more about what I do or any of the other stuff that um, f fellow people like me do, um, it's www.illinoispolicy.org. Um, and if you want to get in contact with me personally, it's uh, J. Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R, at IllinoisPolicy.org. So. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Yay! Yay. And that's a wrap for tonight. We'll see all of you next week. Okay. We exceeded the class size.